Welcome back, Flyers Nitty Gritty fans, to Getting Gritty With It with your host, Yuri Wallach, my partner in crime, back from a week on vacation. I also took a week off to just do fucking nothing. My man, Vasily Giannarakos. What's up, buddy? How you doing? Ah, everything's going good. You know, I got to experience Florida for the first time, so it was pretty fun. Check out Disney World, Universal, all that good stuff, and mainly get like some time off work. Cause it's kind of been crazy for me. Yeah. So nice, nice to relax. I'm sure it's been nice for you to get back to Philly and relax a bit too for a week. Yeah. It was nice to relax for a little bit. And then now I am leaving again to San Diego in two days. So <laughs> hectic, um, hectic, hectic, man. Yeah. But don't worry. No episodes will be missed. Not that it matters too much right now. It's a little slower, but we actually do have an awesome episode today. We we're talking yeah, about a lot, lots yeah. going on, the, which I think is a very promising sign. If you th- just think about it, like it wasn't very interesting to wait for them to finish out this drudge of a season. It is very interesting to talk about the lottery draft and the coach change and the players that are brought over. Like there is, there are signs of progress, excuse me, and potential already. Not a lot, like nothing to write home about, nothing to change your mind about next season, but steps that are at least positive yeah. rather than negative. Um, and then I think moves that can be made and just like stuff that the team can do going forward and things and changes that can be made is a little bit more interesting than watching like a bottom <laughs> five team kind of play out some meaningless games, right? So I think there is more to look forward to, at least from a fan perspective that way. Yeah, no, 100%, dude. Uh, so real quick before we get into our topics, just give a shout out to our sponsor, Jim Stakes on 4th and South. Please go check out Jim Stakes on 4th and South and go get yourself a cheesesteak. It's nice out. You're going to wait in line if you go there. So stand outside. It'll be all right. Get a tan and get a cheesesteak. Yeah, South Street. It's finally not that cold here anymore. So go get a cheesesteak and then go run. Ran five miles (laughs) today. I did eat a cheesesteak last night. I'm not going to say where it was from, but (laughs) uh, cheesesteaks are awesome. So definitely eat a cheesesteak. Okay, let's get into it. Ivan Fedotov. Man, that feels so good to say. Ivan Fedotov signs with the Philadelphia Flyers. I did want to start off with this one directly just because I think it's it's actually a pretty important signing. And, you know, you go back years ago, former seventh-round pick, kind of a big body that they kind of took a swing on. But this kid has progressed very nicely in the KHL. Um, and after the press conference recently where you see the vote of confidence from Fletcher where he thinks he's ready for the NHL, you see that shortly... Um, you know, you see that whole window where they're like kind of talking up Fedotov, he signs, he's ready. Uh, and then all of a sudden now, you know, a lot of question marks pop up as things move forward. Uh, but Ivan Fedotov had a really good, really promising, I guess, start to his, uh, it's hard to call him a prospect, but it's kind of like a prospect start. Uh, but let's just bring up his numbers from last year. Uh, he had a 1.85 goals against average. Uh, in a 937 save percentage. Now, I do want to predicate this, and this is in the KHL first, uh, CSK Moscow. I do want to predicate this. It's a lot harder to score in those leagues. They're not as high as scoring, but still, that's, those are very high numbers. Very and good numbers. Pre- yeah, and the previous year, he had very similar numbers. This year is his best. Uh, I think he won a championship this year, played in the Olympics. Uh, I think. He, yeah, he won the civil, silver medal, and then he won the, the championship in... Russia, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So again, it's a high pedigree guy. I think he's listed at six seven, six eight. Six big, eight, yeah. Yeah. Really big body. Um, I haven't seen enough of him play. I've seen highlights and stuff, but that's really not enough. I'm gonna get a look at him now uh pretty soon. Uh and then you know, the question comes up of Martin Jones. We'll talk about that in a minute, but Vasily, I spoke a lot there. Give your thoughts. I'm sure you want to share. Yeah, of course. Fedotov just getting him signed is obviously great, and it just shows uh, another you know aspect to goalie development in the sense that he was drafted all the way back in 2015, and with goalies, it's not always going to be you know right into the league like a Carter Hart most of the time. More often than not, it's going to be about 25 years old where a guy comes in, a la you know uh, uh, Igor Shosturkin came in when he was 25. Sorokin came in when he was 25. So Fedotov's kind of following those guys who had stellar KHL careers and then uh, jumped to the NHL. So same kind of thing for him. 
Uh, I will say that I have not seen him play too much. I did see uh, the semifinal Olympic game and the final Olympic game. And what I can say just from those two and just briefly watching him is he does have a uh, like some really good positioning to his game and he plays um, deeper in his net. And that's great for a big goalie because, I mean, being 6'8", playing deeper in your net, you cover a whole lot of net, so hard, harder to score. Um, obviously, the quickness you know, factor could be something that may bite him at the NHL level, just because a lot of guys might have quicker releases than in the KHL. So as a bigger goalie, you know, the five will get opened up that way, but I'm sure there'll be an adjustment period, get him over for training camp, get him kind of situated to the NHL ice. But uh, at least from a Martin Jones perspective, like he played well this season as a backup for a team that wasn't that great in the Flyers. But I mean, if you, you know, key into and focus on what Chuck Fletcher was saying that Fedotov is going to have, a real chance to be that number two uh, behind Carter Hart. That just says to me that probably they're going to try to move on from Jones. And a lot of that may also have to do with the fact that, I mean, you have uh, Fedotov, Sandstrom, Urson in the pipeline as goalie prospects. You want to see what they have, obviously. And also the team is kind of, you know, in a, in cap constraints right now. Um, they're, they're trying to, you know, pinch every penny they can to make additions to the roster. So, uh, getting a guy like Fedotov in on a one-year entry-level deal just due to his age, um, because he's 25, it's a one-year deal, uh, is really good. I am I believe it's a 925, uh, as right. every entry-level deal would be. So it'll be you know cheaper than Jones, so there's savings there for the Flyers. And, I mean, he has a lot of skill, a lot of talent, played very well in the KHL. So I think it's a great move and great to see what you have, you know, in, in a goalie that you developed – for so long since 2015, right? So it just shows other prospects, maybe other goalie prospects in the same kind of stratosphere that might be looking for a shot coming up that, you know, the organization is willing to give their own in-house guys a chance um, at a spot, right? Yeah, it would be fucking horrible to watch this guy either never try to come over here or go somewhere Get signed, else. yeah, by someone else. And, and, <clears throat> and the main thing is, too, the Flyers retain his rights even after the one-year deal. He'll still be an RFA. So. That's a good point as well. And I think it's important to say, like, look, aggressive rebuild, whatever. I don't really care about any of that stuff that people are talking about. The two-year, you know, I don't know. People are, are being way too specific about something that, quite frankly, they're giving you guys milestones and stuff that, that telling you what you want to hear. You got to break stuff down realistically. They're going to do what is available in front of them. They're not going to yeah. not going to do the dumbest things and, and bash their head into the wall. It's very rare to see a GM that bad. And we we know who they are if they are really that bad. And Jack Fletcher is not that bad. He has done a great job, but he's not that bad of a GM that he's a complete no. idiot. So there's a process to go about these things. and. Next year, let's be honest, even if all things go well, and let's say we're even back in the playoffs, right? And we even look interesting. Next year is not a year we're going to win the Stanley Cup. No, really, more of an evaluation period of to see kind of what you have and then build on that from there. Well, I would say. E- even if you get back to a good place, like I said, like you're in the playoffs, you're still going to be like, well, you're going to look at your roster and you'll be like, okay, it's not a complete roster if that happens, it's a complete win, but you look at the opportunity right now, you have Jones who is not a long, you know, he's not, he's not going to stay here in Philly for years. You have Hart, who's your stable guy. And you have this guy you developed who's 25 years old. He's, he's the same age as Felix Sandstrom. He's got an awesome pedigree. You got a bunch of young goalies. This is the time to try it. This is the time to try it. Next year is the time to do it. If you don't do it yeah. next year, and let's say you're competitive next year, and then you're expecting to be even better the following year, then all of a sudden you're not going to take it, that risk maybe to bring an unknown commodity. Maybe you do keep a Martin Jones. Yeah. Right now you can afford to take that risk and see, hey, is Fedotov as good as we think he can be here? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then if he is, and you're going into future seasons with a really great, you know, goalie tandem where you're never really going to have to worry if let's say somebody gets hurt, you know, you have a guy that can step up. I was alluding to in a tweet earlier, like it, I could see it kind of almost being like a one, a one B type situation. Sure. Fedotov has the talent. I mean, obviously we have to see how he plays at the NHL level. That's just, that's being optimistic, but, I, yeah. but just from what I saw at the Olympics and just from kind of seeing the other kind of Russian goalies who come over in Sorokin and just I'm going to assume that he's going to be similar to those guys in terms of skill level and kind of just the level. Look, he can at. If the Rangers can pull off the young goalie thing, I mean, we should be able to as well. I don't, I, the way I kind of see it too, is like, I don't really worry about heart. Okay. Look, I really don't. I worry about the way this team plays. Yeah, in like, front of him. In front of him. <laughs> exactly. Uh, 
that that has always been my biggest concern. Even the year where he struggled mightily, uh, excuse me, a season ago, I still think that that was completely exacerbated by the team in front of him. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think this is an opportunity here where you have a guy, I don't know if he's going to be a one B you might, you might be right. You know, I haven't seen enough of him play, but I do, I do know this. You, you really have nothing to lose. Like, exactly. like if you have to bring in a guy like Jones later, Okay, you can do that. You might lose a third round pick. Okay, but you, it would be worse to not find out what you have in this guy. Yeah, and I mean, you always have be the worst thing from, You always have Sandstrom too to lean back on if something, you know, were to go on injury wise. Well, I mean, there's no guarantee they're going to sign him. But imagine I'm assuming, if it works, dude. Yeah, imagine if it works, then your goalie depth is is really great. Well, not only that. It, okay, a seventh round pick turns into a guy that if you have to trade, you can probably get either maybe a second or a first form, even if he's a backup. Yeah, you know, with that type of age and size, Potential. yeah, exactly. It's like you, you, you win there, and and then you have heart. You have sand. It's just like this. In my opinion, this is a nice risk to take, even Definitely. if you don't sign Jones. I I do see them going in with all young goalies. Fucking good. They're not that young. You know, no. twenty five is not that young. Like it is young for a goalie. It is definitely yeah. young for a goalie in the NHL. It's a younger tandem, but it. It's not the worst idea. Maybe you could sign another veteran at maybe a million dollars as well, yeah. and then drop him to the but minors I mean, if you need to. And it's you also have to legible. factor. You also have to factor into that. Okay, Fedotov's a rookie in the NHL, but in terms of like being a pro hockey and a pro athlete, he is not a rookie. He's far from that. He has what one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five KHL seasons under his belt. So, I mean. You're not a rookie. He knows how to prepare. He knows how to approach the game, right? Mm-hmm. He's a rookie to the NHL, but in terms of you know preparation as a goaltender, he's not you know a rookie. And he's not finding his game at this point. He knows what his game is mm-hmm. at, at the age that he's at, right? Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on from Fedotov. Uh, though it is really exciting. I'm sure we'll have more to say about him over the off season, especially when we get to see him. Um, there will be a dev camp this year, and I yeah. do plan on going. That'll be interesting. That'd be cool. Maybe we'll be able to send you the Maple Leafs one. That would also yeah. be cool. To <laughs> scout the competition. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. Let's move into our next topic. And this one is not really a surprise. Uh, it, let's like lump it in with the fact that Chuck Fletcher had a big press conference. But I just want to get like the main point of it out of the way, which is what he, they opened up with. This was obviously broken. Again, by the time you're listening, this has already happened for a week. Um, but, you know, the breaking news by Kevin Weeks. You know, what we all anticipated, Mike Yo has not been invited back to be head coach of the team. There are some other very interesting things that have happened. Yeah, um, very interesting. And maybe, you know, maybe we can move that topic up into the coaching candidates. We can talk about that, you know, right around here. But Mike Yo, now welcome back. The, you know, Fletcher said that he's obviously trying to offer him a job within the organization. Uh, I think Mike Yeo should take it, to be honest with you, um, especially if I don't know if it's an assistant coach. Um, I think what what would be ideal for me, which I don't think is going to happen, would be awesome if he was coach of the Phantoms. Um, yeah, I, I was going to say the same thing. I, I don't think this is going to happen. I think he's probably going to look for an a, uh, NHL assistant job. Most likely. Uh, however, if they can convince him to do that, they have a, re- a relationship um, I think that would be optimal. And he, I mean, I, again, I'd be happy to have him as assistant. Um, I'd be happy to have him in the organization. I really like him. And he's a nice it, guy. Very honest, it, very forthcoming with the media well, as, a, as an interim. Look, it's hard to say he did a great job because again, he was in a horrible position and it never got better as the season yeah. went on. His situation was horrible, but they never got better. They never, they, they got better at certain things. They got better. They got became uh, more well-oiled machine. I've said it, if they were healthier, I think he would have got more out of this team than uh, Vino. But at the end of the day, it's like you can't sell bringing him back. And I'm sure yeah. he knew that walking Based off the results, I, I just think he's a likable guy. And just uh, in terms of him being forth con- forthcoming, very truthful with his answers in terms of like media availabilities, things like that, he mm-hmm. wasn't holding back and gave a lot of insight that a lot of coaches usually wouldn't give. Uh, especially the situation that he was put into, like most interim coaches seem to be tight lipped about, you know, things happening within the room, things like that. Uh, 
the way the team wants to play, you know, the culture of the team. And, and Yo yep. is pretty, pretty forthright with all that type of stuff. Um, it's really no surprise he's not going to be back. As you were saying, Arif, I would love to have him back uh, as coach of the Phantoms. I don't think that's going to happen, unfortunately, because I just feel like he probably thinks himself that he can either, you know, get something in the NHL or something as an assistant in the NHL, probably yeah. an assistant job. Um, I, I would be open to him as an assistant, uh, you know, for the Flyers as well. I think that's just more predicated on who the head coach is that they bring in because in a lot of those situations, uh, you know, a new head coach will want to bring in, in his own staff, his own assistants. So, I mean, if Mike Yo stays in the organization and uh, there's some sort of development scouting role, that would be great. You know, head coach of the Phantoms, even better. Uh, I think it's hard to kind of pinpoint what happens with him until a coach is actually hired by the Flyers and what we might see something uh, that develops with him, at least within the organization. But, um, you know, he he did the best he could with the dealt he was hand or, or with the hand he was dealt. Um, I mean, it wasn't a great, you know, deck of cards like Chuck Fletcher and the team kind of gave to him. And he did, you know, what he could as the interim coach. Or was, <laughs> I, I like don't the think, way you said that. Yeah, he, he did what he could. Yeah, there was I mean, any coach in that situation, I don't think it would have been much different. The results, let's be real. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, hard to disagree on that, man. It's, um, it's a weird, it's a weird position because again, I think we all like him. Like, yeah. um, but it, to get mechanical on everybody, I've seen better coaches fired. I've seen worse coaches fired. I've yeah. seen coaches fired too early. Um, speaking of coaches fired, I mean, to be honest with you, I, I think, this is kind of what I'm I, I was saying. Like, there's this weird thing where all of a sudden there's like potential and promise, um, which I think people will find more as the summer goes on. Maybe we can heal. I do actually, I didn't have this on the topic list, but this is important. This is the same Carcidi article. Um, and I think this is a really important art, uh, point that he had. The Philadelphia Flyers had a 39% drop. Yeah, and I saw TV that. TV rating viewership that is third highest in the NHL. Number one was the Arizona Coyotes, with I think it was 52. And then it was 40 with by Vegas. And then it was 39 by the Flyers. I believe it was 39. Which just and, shows the kind of season they had. <laughs> yeah, and this is a team, like, we were bad before. Stated, like, this is a low point for this team. So I think it's important to see that there is – potential promise here um and i do i do want to let's get right into this because this is big news this just happened today actually as we're recording this um a guy that i think we like joke around about if he was available uh all of a sudden barry trotz has been fired yeah by the new york islanders kind of crazy yeah by lula morello after a down year but a year in which they got consistently better as the season went on they started off you know, kind of with some bad luck yeah. and playing very poorly, never really got back into it. But again, two Eastern Conference finals, losing the Stanley wow. Cup championships, Jack Adams trophy, uh, took a team that quite frankly is not as talented as no. I think they are and took them further. Um, I see it as a mistake, but I like I said, that. is this a serendipitous moment where all of a sudden the Flyers didn't have many good options for coaches? And I'm just going to, and then I'll let you talk in a second. So sorry. Um, but all of a sudden, just top of my head, Barry Trotz, Bruce Boudreau, um, uh, John Tortorella, Paul Maurice, Rick Tockett, just a couple, just those names alone. Dave Tippett yeah. is out there as well. Uh, you know, rumors Bab of Quenville, Quenville, Babcock. All of a sudden, you hear all these names out there, and I know some of these are questionable. I'm not saying those are to be your choice. I think everybody knows who's everybody's top choice right now. Um, but it's still there's something happening here that maybe something is actually changing. That's what I'm saying. Like maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe this won't be as painful as we all think it will be um, potentially. But what do you, what do you think about yo uh, and everything? It's definitely interesting, at least from trots getting fired. Like you said, two Eastern conference finals. Personally, I think the Islanders made a huge mistake with that. Uh, I kind of looked into it after the firing. There's been a, some rumblings that, uh, you know, there was a, some sort of riff or, or not seeing eye to eye with Matthew Barzell and, and Barry Trotz. I mean, I'm not sure about that. I didn't follow the Islanders very closely this season in terms of, you know, locker room politics like that, but it would make sense, I guess. I will say, I will say this though, dude. And I mean this honestly, and 
I think this is a problem, and I don't think this is a Philly problem. I think this is a people problem in sports. There's this new age thing where, because I grew up with sports. We didn't do this when I was younger, okay? I, I know I'm obviously a little bit older than you. We didn't do this to this extent. We are a witch hunt of negativity. Yeah, looking and, for problems where there dude, may not be any. <laughs> dude, th- I, if, if I really want to take people back, and I've been complaining about this for a while at the Flyers, every year is a new person to blame. Every, every year is a new group of people to blame. And then when you're done destroying that one, you move on to the next one. And then now they're the problem. Well, I mean, it, was, it goes back to Mike Richards, really. Well, the first well remember, Hextall <laughs> was an idiot, tar, uh, uh, you know, tyrant by the end. Uh, Craig Berube was a moron. Brayden Shen was lazy. Uh, Claude Giroux was the problem for the for the team. He needed a change room. Oh, no, no, it was Jake Voracek was the problem. Uh, now, obviously, Ivan Provov is the problem. And I do want to talk about that a little bit, how both, not only Chuck Fletcher, but Mike Yo, both of them tried to defend him in front of the media, and the media didn't want to hear it. No. And, and again, I'm not against the media all out and everything here, but I noticed that people like don't they don't want to hear it. Uh, Cam York was helping Ivan Provorov. Then when Cam York was out, Provov got even better. Oh, so it was Ronald Dutar this time that did it. It's it's we are witch hunting to destroy. And in a situation where somebody gets fired, there's always people to point at, right? We oh, yeah. fired Lavillet. He's going to get another job. Like they're good coaches. They're, what do you expect? That, that's what I'm saying. There's always Stanley something Cup wrong. Co- Stanley Cup winning coaches, Lavillet and Trot. When you lose, this stuff comes out. Of that's course. the reality. When you're winning, this shit doesn't happen. Nobody cares. Yeah, because Nobody results, cares. you know, are above everything, and that's sports for you. Well, um, if this team was winning, do you think you would hear, "Oh, Ivan no. Pov is not is a problem in the locker room"? No, 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 not at all. And if people were saying that, people would probably be saying, but, "Well, you don't know what you're talking." When about. When they were better, you never heard a word about it, and people could no. say, "Yes, I did." I I know people who know Pro. I never heard a freaking bad thing about him prior to. Now losing. To be honest, I mean, that whole Provorov situation, the media has been shitting on him a lot of the season. He was not perfect. He deserves some criticism, as does every player. Uh, well, you know, my the- my point, well, can, can I just interrupt you for a second on that? Yeah, I know sure. we're getting, because getting, I've been thinking a lot about this. Why does he have to bend the knee? He is a type A athlete. Yeah. I'd rather have him say, fuck you. See, ah, I would too. Exactly. I don't care about us. No. I would see, is this guy going to go cry in the corner? Or, or is he, he going to be mad about it and want to change things? And say, go That's, fuck yourself. Yeah. We well, always talk about how important confidence is in sports. He's confident in his skills and his abilities. And that's and what you want to see. Yeah, exactly. That's what that answer was to me. Because I don't want to hear it. You guys are annoying me. I agree. He's being a little young and immature in it. But the attitude this is the same thing that Voracek uh, yeah. exuded. Yeah, pretty much. I would rather see... okay. Personally, I'd rather see a, that's what I'm saying. It's I, I'd rather I'd rather see a player show frustration because to me it shows that he cares and that you know he wants to get better and he doesn't like the situation that the team is in right now with that well, frustration. I so, look, I pulled up Dougie. Ha- no, but it, like I pulled up Dougie Hamilton's number or numbers. Oh, we from talked this about year. this off air. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, nine goals. Like what was it? nine goals? Twenty assists or something like that. Nine I mean, goals. Assists. I think it was nine goals. Uh, like nineteen assists. Twenty or twenty-one assists, like thirty points. And Provorov, I think, has thirty-one yeah. points. He, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. I think he has two points less than Provorov, and he's a minus twenty-one on the season. Yeah. But nobody's shitting on Tuggy Hamilton. <laughs> and again, this is number one guy out there. But this is my point. He's not on a great team. His numbers aren't great. You don't think you put him on an all-star team, those number Dougie Hamilton's numbers won't go back up to 50, 60 points and a, and a plus of 10? they will. But this is the thing. When you're playing on a bad team and you're playing a ton of minutes on a team that has trouble scoring goals like the Flyers did this year, your numbers are going to suck. Fe- yeah, your offensive numbers aren't going to be the best. And, and not only that, they're going to game plan around you to yeah. find your weaknesses because majority of players in the NHL cannot do it by themselves. Again, we talk about like 1%. There's a reason we talk about Crosby and all these – because – they're unstoppable people. Yeah. Like, those are the those are the players that actually are those 1% where majority of the NHL players are good players or good hockey players, but they need a team around them yes. to be able to, you know, and, and even well. to hit and even to hit that 1%, it's sometimes it's not sustainable. And sometimes it takes some years to get there. Yeah, pretty you much. Know? Uh all right, we we diverted there quite a bit, but I I, I we, let's get back to the Barry Trotz thing. He's obviously available. 
Yeah. I, some people say, you know, like, why would he want to come to this team? Uh, when he went to the Islanders, they were not good. They no. were just lost their captain, right, to free agency. And they Very just bought a brand new GM. They had no stadium at the time. Like, that was, it was also a mess. Yeah. I mean, if you look at Trot's team, if you look at Trot's teams, uh, and just what he kind of looks for. I mean, what's a staple of his teams is, is really good goaltending, and he usually likes to build his systems around his goaltenders. Uh, Carter Hart is a really good goalie, so that's a plus for Trotz. I mean, he has some good young defense. He would definitely like Couturier. Couturier and Hayes. Both he would, specifically Couturier, though. I mean, you think about yeah, the way Barry sure. Trotz has played his career. It's like... Keep a system around Couturier. have... Back in the day when they weren't good in Nashville. Oh, uh, yeah, David, they, yeah, David Legwand. David Legwand. Who's the, Jason Arnott. That's yeah, what I was trying Jason to Arnott like, well, You're yeah. getting a Jason Arnott on steroids with, with Couturier. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, again. His system would definitely fit Couturier's game. Do you think he fits the team? Style. Um, It's hard because he, I like I like what you were saying with Katuri and Hayes. And I think the young defenseman he would be good with. And I think Arista Linen and obviously type. Logan Cooley and, you know, yeah, <laughs> potentially, you never know the <laughs> way it's making, looking. I know. Just but, uh, it. but, uh, you know, j- j- just, uh, with Kevin Hayes, Katuri, I think those two would fit his, you know, mold, even a Joel Faraby type kind of fits. Oh, definitely. Fits his mold. Atkinson. Atkinson as well. So I think there's a lot of players that would exceed like excel under, uh, his system and really, you know, perform well. Um, there are some younger guys that I would be iffy about, like a Frost, the Tippet. Like I don't know how they're gonna yeah, do. Frost. I don't know how they're gonna do under a Trot system. I don't know how you know a Sandheim's gonna be under a Trot system just because it's more defensive minded. But with those young defensemen and just the way kind of he had Palak and um, Palak, yeah, Palak and Palak. Cool. Palek and Pulak, yeah. Pulak and Pulak. I always get them mixed up because they sound exactly the same. Anyway, just the way you had those guys play where before, you know, he was there, nobody really was touting them as number one defenseman. I think he'd be able to really get a lot out of Provorov and, and Ellis and, and even risk the line with the way risk the line can be physical and how his system kind of is yeah. where, you know, they use a lot of interference to kind of get the puck off well, people. <laughs> I think, and I think even if Trotz is not the guy, there's right? a lot like, of really good options as well. I, I, I think like Paul Maurice. I like Paul. Yeah. Maurice. I like Jim Montgomery. Even oh yeah, Jim Montgomery. Jim Montgomery as well. I didn't mention him. And then obviously Bruce Boudreaux. Apparently that deal is up in the air with Vancouver. There's a lot so, of options. That I honestly, if if Trotz is not the guy, I think Bruce Boudreaux might be my number two. That just would because, be smart. He's a very well, offensive coach, and I mean this he, team has trouble scoring goals. Very Boston, offensive, so. but he gets you into the playoffs. And I know he hasn't won it. Let's get into the playoffs first. Let, it, let's let be that first place team that just can't get over the hump. And then I'll worry about who my coach is. But he also gets players you know? feeling good about themselves and he gets them playing. That's my their, point. He gets, yeah, them playing exactly. their, he gets them playing their game. Like if you look at what was going on in Vancouver with Travis Green, you know, Pedersen was underperforming. Besser was underperforming. JT Everybody. Miller was underperforming. And as soon as Boudreaux came in, all those guys started scoring, you know. That's what we need. We rate. need a guy who makes yeah. them believe in themselves again. Exactly. So that would be a good hire. Uh, personally, I mean, Trotz would be my number one just because the Flyers' defensive structure the last two years has been shit. Let's be real. Hasn't I been could good. see Vegas going for Trotz too. Yeah, that as well. So, like, their defensive structure has been bad. If you get Trotz in, at least you know your team will ha- always have his defensive systems and structure to fall back on. And yeah. the Flyers, you know, could use that and it'll help them be a lot more competitive than they were this season. Um, personally, I would go Trotz first. I mean, you yeah. can't deny his skill set. You got to try it. You got yeah. yeah, to go, You got to go with it. Um, if it isn't Trotz, I probably, I would lean towards Montgomery, Montgomery yeah. next. Then Paul Maurice, then Tortorella, probably after that. Really? So Boudreaux's not even your top three. I like Boudreaux. It's just I think that like Montgomery's very forward thinking, um, and just the way he coached his systems in Dallas, um, it was kind of similar to a Boudreaux, and he's a younger coach. So I just think maybe it might be you know a better fit with the players and just the team in general. Fair enough. They're, they're, they're similar coaches, I would say. Fair enough. I honestly. I think Tortorella, and it's not because I don't like Tortorella. I just don't know if Tortorella is going to fit in 
yeah, with this too. team. I don't have a problem with him in the media. I can give a flying fuck. I really don't have any problem with tor- stuff Tortorella says. No, even it's where he got upset, at- it's entertaining. Well, even fun. even the stuff where he's like upset that people are doing like tricks and shot. From a coach's standpoint, it's exactly what I expect. A coach Dude, doesn't want that. He it's wants a ris- it's a yeah. risky play. Exactly. Uh, He'd yeah. rather you make the safe play. I That's think majority of coaches would react like that behind the scenes. That's the Probably. difference. Is he's dumb enough to do it in front of me. What do you think about Quenville? Let's say Quenville gets reinstated by Batman. Would you be interested in that? Look, people might not like this answer. I want to win a fucking Stanley Cup. If he's the right coach for this team, I'd be open to it. He's a good coach. He is a good coach. I'd be open to I'd be open to it as well, despite you know all the uh behind the scenes kind of yeah. stuff that occurred. Now, and I know people say it's unacceptable. I didn't look into the story as much as everybody else. I know what he was doing, I just don't believe in like cancel culture unless he like legitimately broke the law. If he's hurting people, it's yeah. a different story. Maybe, maybe it does go to that level, and I just don't know enough about it. From my understanding, he wrote a letter of recommendation. Like, I get it, but people fuck up in life. Again, if he understands he screwed up, it's a complicated issue. He's not my top choice because of those things, but if it wasn't for those things, he would be a top choice. Definitely. So it's hard for me to say I would never consider him ever. Um, I don't know. I, I believe I in second that. chances too, especially if it's not like the end of the world. Like I'm not saying the guy who raped the player should be given a second chance. No, right? fuck that but guy. Maybe the people around him who kind of didn't handle it the best way because they never dealt with anything like that before. Is there a second chance after, you know, they realized and reflected and understood, you know, and got publicly and embarrassed. Yeah. And, yeah. But when you do things like that in a similar situation, if it was to happen, you know, again, hypothetically, I'm sure he's going to react in a totally different way than he did previously. So that's, yeah. what, you, that's what you want, right? You want guys no to learn about from that now. Mis- you want guys to learn from their mistakes. So if he's learned from his mistakes, then I'm on board with that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. So we got into the coaches. Promise there. Nobody, I don't think anybody expected Barry Trotz on the, no, that was like a- the national broadcast to get fired. That was a huge, uh, you know, a, a huge surprise, I think, to everybody. I got excited, though. Oh, yeah, definitely. You, Makes you the Islanders messaged, worse. You messaged me like, Trotz got fired. I'm like, oh, man. I wasn't aware at first. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. I saw. <laughs> I, I have a uh, alert set up for Elliot Friedman. And it said Trotz fired. I was like, I was, I was running at the time. Yeah. And I was like, literally, I saw it. It popped up on my phone, and I went, I was like, oh, my God. I was just like started sprinting. And all I could think about was uh, like who we're going to hire for coach. I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And then I was like, man, even even a guy like Trotz can get fired. Which is just shows. I mean, look at his track record too. the last couple of seasons. Cup with Washington, Eastern Conference Finals. Like he's been so re- like, dude, we would die for one year like this year that oh, the yeah. Islanders had. With uh, two years of going to the Eastern Conference Finals, like our team has not had that much success for a while. And quite frankly, I don't look at the Islanders team and go, man, look at all that talent. No, he made a lot out of nothing aside from like Matt Barzal and, you know, a couple of the defensemen. Like Noah Dobson looks they're, really good. They, but, and the like goal. they're a bubble team. Yeah. They're a bubble and team. They, and when they get in. That's the thing with his system. Playoff, like, contender. You get into the playoffs with Trotz's system, and like you can go on a run just the right. way it's structured. And that, that's attractive if I'm the Flyers because you're likely going to be on the bubble next season. So I was, you know, we were talking about this. How do you inspire some hope in this fan base? You want to do that, Chuck Fletcher? Like I Barry saw people Trotz. joking around. You yeah. know, you got, you said you have a blank check. Give it to Barry. <laughs> I mean, you again, you want to turn people towards your favor to show that you guys have a plan. You're gonna, you know, that you have some. You're bringing in somebody really smart. Like, who's talk gonna deny Barry Trotz? Talk about structure within your team, structure within your culture. Barry Trotz immediately brings that, and just respect, and just the, you know, credentials from the past few seasons of results that he's put together yeah. as a coach. Like, automatically, you know, it brings the Flyers into, I, I would say, a, a better situation than they've been coaching wise for, I mean, a decade, probably since Laviolette. Yeah. And I and I don't know where he lives. Like I didn't really look into his life. He's from anything. Winnipeg. He's from Winnipeg. He's so one, people Winnipeg. Are, we people are putting together like, oh, maybe he's uh, you know Winnipeg. It's possible to back to Winnipeg. It's completely possible. There's going to be tons of teams that are going to be after yes. Vegas. I I'm, I could see Detroit pushing to try to get him. There's 100%, a hundred percent, dude. If the Leafs it, lose in the first round, you think they're not going to be all over that? Like, there's a no. lot of teams. I don't think the dude. <laughs> 
I am under, I think I'm in the minority with the Leafs. That I don't expect them to panic at all. I think it would be a humongous mistake for them to fire key and, uh, and to trade, um, uh, What's his name? Marner. Like, don't do any of that shit. You have a great fucking team. You guys are getting better every year. This is the best you guys have ever looked. In the time yeah. that I've been alive, this is the best Leafs team that I've seen in a while. There's yeah. no reason you can't build on what you're doing. They definitely can. Not- I just... You just gotta no, but you're like, right. Toronto's it's, a pressure cooker, so there's something's gonna happen if they lose again. And, and again, go back to what I said in the beginning. I wasn't talking about Philadelphia fans. I'm talking about, yeah. like, th- this is what we do. Like, something yeah. will go wrong in Toronto. Steve Dangle, and I watch his podcast quite often. If you go back to when the Leafs lost in that first round and the way he talked about the Maple Leafs, like he essentially is saying, like, this team is a bunch of losers. Yeah, it's the sky's falling. That's what it always is. And if you look at the way they're talking now, they're like, Stanley Cup, we're going to win. We got to remember the narrative when a team loses. It's always like that. That's my point. It's like, there's nothing wrong with it. We're all doing that. We're doing that now because the sky's falling with the Flyers. Sky, like you don't think the Arizona Coyotes fans think like the fucking sky is falling? Oh yeah, and that one might be legitimate. Like they have nothing. They like, don't even have an arena, so. <laughs> but they do have a ridiculous amount of draft picks, which is crazy. Which it'll be interesting to see what they do with the draft with that. If they actually make all those picks or decide to do. Can you imagine if or... they get Connor Bedard and he has to play in a stadium of three and a half thousand people? I mean, I that's kind of. I feel crazy. like the NHL would step in and be like. No. They're trying to make some sort of <laughs> aren't they trying to like build some new yeah, arena yeah, yeah. or something? Yeah, but the, the it's gonna be know. a couple years. It's gonna yeah. be a couple years. So that's fuck, man. Imagine you have one of the most exciting young talents playing in a three thousand person arena. I'm sure the NHL's somebody, not gonna somebody be somebody who might end up being better than McDavid and you can only fill his stadium. Yeah. To four thousand people a night. They're gonna when you should be filling twenty. Something's got to give if that happens. If that situation actually unfolds, there'll be something that happens to get them into somewhere where they can. I think get we're going to see another Eric Lindros situation where he's going to say, I'm not trade. signing an ELC. I'm going to go play in Europe. I, if I was him, I would kind of do the same, to be honest. I would want to play for the Coyotes yeah. just in the situation they're at. Right. Um, interesting thing on Trots, um, just for just to finish sure. up here, um, on the um, Jeff Merrick show, uh, Elliot Freeman was on today and and was saying there's lots of pressure on the Flyers to be really good really quick, and that he can't see how the Flyers wouldn't be all over and all in on Trotz, which they should be. So just from an insider... Trotz, I, I think Trotz and Goudreau, if Goudreau makes yeah, it, I, I think they'll be I in agree. on both. Uh, I, I think, look, if I'm over the cap, but I sign Johnny Goudreau, I'm in a pretty I'll figure good... It out. I'll figure it out later. I have I have off-season, you know, over just... I, I can buy out. I can. I, my team is, again... This is about stepping stones. And let's, let's get into the press. This actually aligns perfectly with what I was about to talk about, right? Flyers are retooling, right? Fletcher had a press conference going. Uh, he pointed out, right? 2019, he brought in Hayes. He brought in Niskanen. He brought in Braun, right? He yeah. brought in some some good players. Nothing like out of this world. Mixed in with the right group. Brought in a new coach. Energy was different. And I know, I know, I know. Most of it has not been that way, but there was something there that was happening. We all saw the way that team played. Yeah. Again, on the ice, they're not more talented than the group that we have right now. No. Maybe slightly because we had Voracek and Drew, you know, uh, maybe a little bit, but we, we're definitely a deeper team now. There's this is an opportunity here. Like you add a guy like Goudreau, you add a Trots, yeah, you know. You bring well, think, in a top top three pick or whatever. Yeah, I just think with the Flyers and, and the situation that they're in right now, they shouldn't be afraid, you know, to look into anything or any player if it's going to make the team better. Why not, right? Well, I mean, quite frankly, like, if you have an opportunity to bring a superstar player in, you take it. Exactly. And Especially you, losing Claude Giroux. So. Ex- well, that's the thing. It's like, what's the worst that'll happen? You have to trade... Uh, AVR or... You, yeah. you, yeah, you get rid of, you buy out JVR, you trade Lindblom. And now you have Johnny it, Gaudreau. Like, it, it, exactly. But that, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, it sucks to lose Lindblom, but like, but then you got Johnny Gaudreau. And you have a superstar player that has 100 points this season, and none of those guys have even combined for 100 right. points this past season. So, you know, it's just a no brainer. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think these are the signs of like finding hope. And I, I think. You know, people can call Fletcher delusional. I don't think he's delusional. I think he's not a very aggressive man. I think maybe that that helps him a little bit. He's not delusional. He's not stupid. None of this shit. Um, but, you know, I don't think he's been that great 
I think a lot of the stuff he's done, you know, he's made some mistakes, but he also has done some good stuff as well. Yeah. Um, and I think he's kind of pointing those like, hey, like this, this doesn't have to be like a, t- you know, a five, six year build. You know, I think he has a point though, you know, like be a little bit patient. Let me make some moves and maybe I can at least get us in the yeah. right direction before and I get I fired. Think, uh, I think, you know, well, <laughs> hey, they all get fired eventually. eventually. They all get fired. Eventually. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Either promoted or fired. Pretty much. So we'll see what happens with him. It's either he's going to be Danny Breer's boss. Yeah, he's going to either be da- Danny Breer's boss or he's going to be fired. But uh, we'll see what happens. Whoa. Um, hold on one second. What? Hold on one second. No Gor- Gorgiev in for the third. Oh. Did Sturkin get injured or did he just get blown out? Oh, what's the score right now? Oh, um, six, yeah, I'm checking it right six, now. 6 2 uh, Penguin. Oh, yeah, he got blown out. That's two in a row, eh? That Yorgiev's gone in. Not looking good for the Rangers. Oh my god, Shesterkin must not be that good. Yeah, or maybe the team in front of him just isn't playing very well right yeah, now. Yeah, I'm just laughing because it's like... <laughs> but that's like a classic Flyers thing from this past yeah. year. Yeah. Carter Hart, or even the past We thought he was good, that. but he blows in the playoffs. Shesterkin, yeah. <laughs> MVP, but he couldn't do it when it really counts. That's what that's going to be the Rangers fan. Oh, likely. 100%, even though he's, what, 24, yeah. 23 years old? And, like, just had one of the best, you know, seasons. Seasons in goalie. NHL history. Yeah, yeah. kind of nuts. I mean, what do you expect, though? Like, that Rangers team is very young. They don't have much playoff experience. Crosby and Malkin and Latang and that Fucking Penguins Pittsburgh. team. I know, right? When you Just when you think, dude, they're going to fall dude, off. Fucking Jake Gensel, man. Yeah, he's going off. He has like he's, five goals already. In the Mark Friedman scored. Yeah, Jake Gensel is a, a really good player. Yeah, Crosby obviously makes him better, but he there's lots of talent there. Every time I look uh, at him, he reminds me of the singer of Yellow Card. Oh yeah, he does kind of look similar to him. You know what I'm talking Could, about? Yeah. Oh, I do know. Yeah. Um, fuck, they have that one big hit. I forget the name, but uh, there's a lot. Ocean Avenue. Oh, Ocean Avenue. That's the one. There yeah. Go. And then they have way, way, way. All right. Yeah, William Ryan Key, right? No, I don't know his name, but that's his name. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I, I listen to his solo stuff. He rips it, but uh, I didn't even know he had solo stuff. Yeah. And yeah. now you know exactly. <laughs> but cool. uh, d- yeah. So so just uh, going going with the retooling stuff and just going back to you know it, things being similar to 2019. I think Fletcher kind of mentioned that to walk back. You, you know. Sure, the team wants to retool. They want to be aggressive. They want to make moves if they can make them. But there's also going to be a level of patience there where, you know, we don't have to do and have to make these big splashy moves for them to pay off um, and, you know, be effective moving forward. Like, was Hayes at the time a splashy type of move? Was this well, going to be a splashy type of move? Was Braun Hayes, a Hayes was. The other two Hayes were was. Not. No, but that's what I mean, right? You can add in solid pieces and solid players though, that can have a big effect on your roster. Though, I would argue that the Niskanen deal at the time for me, and people can, you know, I know how I felt at the time. I was extremely enthusiastic about that. I like that deal because, I mean... But, but overall, did. nobody yeah. thought he was going to be the impact that he was. Yeah. I, I did, but most people yeah. didn't like Matt Niskanen like I like Niskanen. Well, I have a buddy who's like, I was always in it. Who loves the Washington Capitals? So I, he'd always talk Niskanen up to me and how Niskanen and John Carlson pair was like a dream, like Dude, chef's kiss for Washington. I, so, I, so I remember when they traded Gudis for Niskanen, he was pissed. He's like, "Why did we do this?" Because they lost that trade. Yeah, and I'm just like, I'm like, "Fuck yeah, let's go on that." Well, but, uh, I remember playing against Niskanen. And I remember how hard he was to play against all the time. Yeah, really good on Pittsburgh. Always really good for the Caps. So always physical. Move. Yeah, always everywhere. But it just shows there's players out there that you can get where it might not be the biggest name guy, but depending on the fit, the depending impact. on yeah, depending exactly. on the fit, depending TJ on Brody and uh, play with in Toronto uh, for the for the Leafs. Yeah, what does he make four million a exactly. year? He's not like exactly. Even like a guy that I think about go back to Washington, like Washington acquired TJ Oshie, obviously a while back. That wasn't the biggest trade, the biggest acquisition at the time, but look at everything yeah. he's contributed to that. I team. always loved him. That's a yeah. great, that's a great call out. He's always been one of my favorite players in the league. So I think that's what Fletcher trying, was kind of really trying to say. Line player. Like, you know, they're going to go off for the Gaudreaux. They're going to go off for the high end guys and try to get them. But there's also going to be, you know, look into some other guys that they might not have that same cachet, but they can also contribute. Like a, a guy that comes to mind for me, at least on the offensive side, would be an Andre Palat. I mean, if he isn't signed back with Tampa Bay, he's a guy that will score you 20 goals and is tough to play against 
works really hard in the corners. That's a guy I'd like to add. I mean, another winger, obviously, and probably guys would be moved out if he was to be brought in. But like, that's a move to look to. I would say. I wouldn't hate Andre Palat, but I I know I know what you mean though. Maybe that type of player at center would be perfect. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you know, encouraging stuff there. You, you know, he kind of was talking about the age groups of the players. You look at the Flyers, you know, kind of building core. The age groups are about the same. It's right now. It's about want. twenty-one to twenty-five. Yeah, you want, want guys to grow up in the same system together, learn how to play with each other. Yeah. All that type of stuff. Um. So, and again, he said he needs to add some veterans to balance out that age group. We'll see how that happens. Again, the Johnny Goudreau group is kind of perfect. Obviously, Phil Forsberg, I don't think he'll make it to free agency. But, um, yeah. you know, things like that, that's a possibility. If not this offseason, maybe it'll take next year. Yeah. Maybe, you, maybe you wait the year out, clean it out, you know, go in the bo- Connor Bedard or whatever top guys race. And uh, Mitchikov is the other guy. It's a ridiculous yeah. draft to be bad. He looks really good as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, and crazy thing with Goudreau, uh, just, just back to him, is, you know, you have him and Hayes connection. They played a BU together. And are very mm-hmm. good friends, so that always factors into it with free agents. Guys talk um, with uh, Goudreau. Yeah, saying. with good, yeah, Goudreau and Hayes uh, played together uh, at uh, BU, and they're Kevin also Hayes very good is friends. Our best scout, dude. Yeah, that's what I mean, right? No, he let so us down this past year, but still. But yeah, you have you have the Hayes connection there, so I'm sure they'll talk. And Goudreau's a Philly guy, so that factors into it. Also, I mean, if if you're on the Goudreau train, you're probably wanting Calgary to lose in the first round because then they're going to probably make a major change. I would say either Kachuk or him or somebody's going to have to be gone. Yeah, because um, they have signings to make. They're not, um, and they're not letting go Kachuk. Realistically, it would no, be it would be it would be Goudreau, and he just, got out, he just got Major called out by Daryl Sutter the other night. So yeah. And then he Which, can be our headache to deal with, and then our media will hate him by the end. You might apparently. be from this city, but you don't play like you're from this you city. You don't play. Johnny. You don't play like a broad street. Boy. Yeah, you don't hit anybody, and he doesn't. You score a hundred points though. So yeah. <laughs> hey man, people hated on Briere at the end of his time here too. What do we um, think about the uh, assessing the medical staff? I thought that was very interesting that they're going to do a top to bottom assessment there. I think they have no real choice when you find out uh, the head of your medical staff has cancer. Yeah, of from, course. Uh, the situation that you have, it's it, obviously I don't think they're related in that sense, but like kind of crazy how it's all coming out at once. It just seems like changes are coming. For yeah, that medical 100%. staff. Uh, and I, I saw. Oh, sorry to cut you off there. No, guys. go ahead, please. Oh, I saw uh, during the you know the exit day and the break off day press conference. Joel Farabee said he kind of rushed back from injury. Uh, yeah, I saw, and his yep. shoulder. His shoulder was not as strong as it could have been. That affected his play. Um, even you know Kevin Hayes coming back early. Lots of players, even Ellis, arguably maybe coming back early. So there's something to uh, uncover there. Maybe there's a way of like the injuries being reported and how that kind of needs to change in the structure of that. And the medical team really needs to put their foot down because players want to play. But I mean, at the end of the day, you don't want guys to rush back from injury because it's going to just make them longer and prolong them. So I think it's really something they need to look at and they need to kind of maybe overhaul uh, just the system of how they kind of deal with these that, things and how they report them. They have to figure out how to save players from themselves. That too. Yeah. You know, because I, I still stand by this where it's like, you know, you guys can get re- mad at the medical staff and all that, but it, Pocket players want to play. It's, it's, yeah, but it takes the player to, to clear it. If the player says, "Oh, I feel great," yeah, and he's in pain, yeah. what are they gonna do? What are they gonna do? Yeah, no, no, you're in pain. I, yeah, I can tell. You know, so it's maybe like, just a more opening up, like, and that's kind of a management thing that you kind of maybe need to instill if you're Chuck Fletcher. You know what? Well, if, you, if you aren't feeling like you can play, it's fine to not. It's fine to not play. I think. You know, well, I think. Built. I think there's probably stuff that you and I don't know much about that you can put in place to. You know, force guys to prove their health. Yeah. You know, it just be some sort of testing, their... some sort of a yeah, game. exactly. And maybe that's the type of stuff they'll look at. I don't know, but it's good. It's a good sign that they re- it's a good sign that they realize there's an issue, though. You know what I mean? It's, yes. And they're and not they... kind of turning a blind eye to it. And they were open with it. You know. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, last kind of piece of news from the press conference there uh, that Fletcher mentioned. And also, he had his own press conference. Uh, unfortunately. Samuel Moran uh, announced his retirement uh, this past week. And it's just a really shitty situation for a guy who's just a, a great person and, you know, a really hardworking individual that I hoped I would have seen play again, just to all the rehab and hard work that he, he put in, you know, to be a player and just a 
got ruined by injuries. Just a real, real, real sad for him. What, what do you think there, you Reeve? Yeah, I mean, I've followed more for a long time. You know, he had some really inspiring moments where he scored goals, came back. He looked like he was going to be. Looked like he was going to be a six defensive for the team, at least for me coming out of last season but i always i always liked his game i liked his meanness i liked the way he moved on the ice i definitely saw a role from him in the nhl if he was healthy yeah. i was hoping he could play you know it's it's almost a shame we like wasted the one good season he had healthy as a fucking forward yeah i know right? <clears throat> until the end of the season we put him back as a defenseman and then realized oh yeah he's actually got a little more value this way um and then you know it's just it's sad. And Morin's could, couldn't have a young guy. A better he's, guy. A, he's a young guy too, to only twenty six, right? But also so. couldn't have him no better guy because he's a guy who really worked his butt off all the yeah, time and appreciated exactly. always being there. It's not like a guy who took it for granted and no. just kind of gave up. It's not a Ben Simmons situation here. It's a guy who no, he no matter came what back happened, from what was it again, three again. three ACL tears three ACL tears, which is crazy the amount of work and rehabbing you have to do. That's literally it's, years dedicated just rehabbing an injury like that um so just really unfortunate and by you know by the looks of it the flyers are definitely opening to are open to having him you know get a position in the organization so i'd love to see him you know come on another you know development team some sort well, of scouting position uh, honestly i what i would think they'd probably give him a role as is probably like strength and conditioning yeah that um uh, considering that's what you had to train so hard at majority yeah. of the time you were here figure out how to work your body how to fix it you know, that, sometimes that, I never it, thought about that, but that'd be really smart. Maybe we'll see like a Riley Cote type of situation where, you know, gets maybe an assist yeah. with the Phantoms. Potentially. I always really liked his personality. It's it definitely very, sucked. very nice guy. Just and, just and I'm sure this team needed another first round pick that can't play again. Yeah, um, right. Out that, of all the injury news. <laughs> I mean, like essentially, like if you look at the failures over the years, like it's him, Rubtsov, Patrick. The injuries also. Jay O'Brien. I don't know if you want to loop him in there, but mm, not yet. But, but could it could happen. Be. Yeah. Patrick LeBurge wasn't a first round pick, but he was close. Yeah. He was like what um, 32nd overall or something like Yeah, and he was ranked in the first round. Yeah. It's this not is, good luck. This shit not sucks. good luck. But you know what? Hopefully that shows that the bad luck has to end at some fucking point and things start to turn around. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Famous speaking, last of, words. speaking of injuries, uh, do you want to just go into the you know the Ryan Ellis stuff quickly? I'm sure a lot of people know you know that there is a treatment plan in place you know, for Ellis coming up. And it's funny, I like didn't positive. even think to talk about it. Yeah, I know, right? There's so like, much. Did, it didn't even cr- well, it didn't even cross my mind because I was like, okay, you know, I was like you still yeah. don't know. No, yeah, it's still up in the air. You don't know, but I think it's at least good that there's some sort of plan in place to treat it. I thought the telling thing was that um, in the Fletcher press conference, when they kind of asked him about it, uh, he said that, you know, it's a treatment plan where we're going to really know how it's taking effect in, you know, four to six weeks from now. Um, so I thought that's interesting because that's about the time where, you know, four that's or six they said, eight, yeah, that's about the times that they said initially, which is kind of ironic, yeah. <laughs> but, but also it's ironic because at that point, at least if you know, it's not working, the team, it still has time to kind of, find an alternative yeah Yeah, reshape their plan at least at least it's not like something where well we're gonna know 12 weeks from now and the drafts pass and free agencies two days away we don't know what the fuck we're doing it it also goes back to what i was saying like look as soon as ellis started having problems here and there were injuries what immediately these rumors came out i'm not naming anybody i don't care but immediately the rumors came out he doesn't want to be here he has a problem with the locker room. What he did he say? With the team and his what, availability, right? He literally came out and said the exact opposite because this is what we do. We yeah. bring the toxicity into all these situations where sometimes there is, most of the time there isn't, and most of the time we're the ones especially, creating. It. Okay, especially with a veteran guy like Ellis, who like was known in Nashville as like a great locker room guy. That's why I kind of knew this was all bullshit. Like when it came out initially, I'm like, this guy never had any rumblings of this ever occurring at all whatsoever in Nashville over like a decade long career. <laughs> if there was some sort of locker room issue where you know, or cultural issue with just the way he carried himself, you would have heard something by now. So that's how you kind of know it's bullshit. That's the first thing. Uh, second thing is, you know, as a guy who's injured and, and he's a competitive guy, and he even said this himself, it was hard to be around the team when they were doing so poorly and he knew that he could do nothing to help. 
And that's yeah. a natural thing as a human being, right? Like if you know that you can't do anything to help a situation, sometimes you will, will remove yourself from that situation mm-hmm. because there's not really much you could contribute. And in his situation, what could he have contributed really? Not much. So not much. I can't really, I can't really blame him. And I, I'm just happy that he, he, you know, they got him in as the last interview on, on exit interview day there to kind of clear things up. So we don't have a whole summer of Ryan Ellis is a wannabe or he hates the flyers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because it would have <laughs> continued if he didn't speak. You, you, you know that for sure. Uh, so. Again, again, they do this to everyone. Sometimes it's true. Most of the times it's, not or yeah. extremely exaggerated. Mike Richards. And, and, so and, and just, just to the whole Provorov blow up story thing, Jake Voracek several years ago screamed at an un, I'm, I will leave the name out. I know who it is. Screamed at a big media guy in the uh, locker room in front of everyone. Like, I'm not talking about like what Provorov did where he closed his arms and went, I, you know, whatever guys, well, I don't know. Yeah. Like screamed at this dude. And if you guys think this is the only time that this stuff happens where you were talking about high end athletes being criticized by people who quite frankly, can't even skate. And I'm not like Mr. Athletic here, but this is also why I don't talk about athletes this way. Cause God forbid they see what you're saying and you're just shit talking yeah. behind a microphone or behind a computer. It's the number one rule that I have at uh, flyers nitty gritty. It's the number one rule. If you are going to shit talk, you are not a keyboard warrior. You no. need to be able to insult these players in a way you can do it to their face. Yeah, exactly. Do it in a professional manner or at least do it where there's some sort of st- statistical analysis backing up what you're saying and not just saying, well, he's bad because he's bad and that's why. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a lot of people's opinions on pro right now that, well, he's not, you know, he's not a top pair defenseman. And why? Well, he just isn't. Yeah. And there's look, not any reasoning behind it, realistically. And, and look, he, he even took it out on the wrong guy. And I thought, you know, we, Jordan Hall is not a guy who's ripping on pro No. That's not, it's not, it's not like he saw Jordan Hall's comment and went, well, fuck this guy. That was, hey, I'm poking to you. everyone. Direct well, to it's everyone. because literally just poke and poke and poke and poke and poke. And then you, you get frustrated. Poke over and over again. And it depends on the guy's personality. They're either going to one, shut down, two, tell you to fuck off, or three, just ignore it. They, like, that's really the guy's. Program went, pro went with the fuck off round. What we yeah, talked about earlier it, is that I'd rather a high end athlete be frustrated like that because it shows he really gives, you know, a shit and it shows he really cares. And that's, that's my opinion on it. I, I, I want to see a player who's confident in himself above everything, all the other stuff, all the stuff that people are, I, I don't, don't care about any of that stuff. I agree with that. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I, again, I've brought this up over and over again. I mean, I've seen some of the best defensemen of all time traded. Most of them are struggle in their mid twenties. People don't like to hear that. They want to hear that these guys are perfectly ready at the time. They're 25. That's all nonsense i still don't understand how people are selling that to themselves like i get that kale mccarr i get that i get these guys exist that's like a generational type talent it's it's, it also we've seen that sometimes it happens and it doesn't go anywhere from there yeah great defensemen usually take time about their mid-20s that's where they start to flourish and that's where they become the best that they can be so anything but that i don't care what people are saying to me i've been watching the sport long enough to know the difference well, I, I'm going to give you a lot of examples. And I mean, I'm hoping Chuck Fletcher learned from his mistakes in the past. He traded away Brent Burns at a very young age. What happened? They, right. They, they He couldn't play defense. They had to put him at forward, right? Because he just couldn't play D. He and, wasn't good enough. Yeah. Look what happened. All-star there. defenseman for look eight what, years in a row. Look what happened there. Look at Chris Pronger. He got traded not only from the Hartford Whalers, but also from, from the St. Louis Blues in it very early, early in his career. And here's a Flyers reference for you as well. Eric Desjardins from Montreal was thought, you know, that he didn't have, you know, the capabilities to be, uh, you know, a good puck wing defenseman Devin, in the league. And, lo- and look how well his Devin Taves in so, fucking yeah. uh, from Long the Islanders. Island. Exactly. They, they moved on from him. Dude, how many defensemen have you seen do well one year and then have a down year and then everybody turns on them and then they do well again the next year? But also year? you got to look at the team surrounding the guy, right? Like a lot of those players you mentioned were on bad teams when they got traded. Yes. So T- TJ Brody there. in particular, like that guy found his way to the leaves, but like several years ago, he was like one of the best defensemen in the NHL and it kind of yeah. dropped off a little bit. It's like the, these guys, like they're still great defensemen. 
like just because they're not like peak performance, you know, but there's like the savviness and the smarts that come with it. And some of them can keep the elite skill through wow. all of their 30s. Like, 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 again, it's hard to compare all these defenses like Pronger. But just look at like Matt Niskanen for is one perfectly like this is a guy who just literally had his best season with the Flyers the year before he retired. Yeah, but also that's another example that Matt Niskanen started his career off with Dallas. They traded him very early, early in his career to Pittsburgh. Uh, like, and and look what happened there, right? So yeah, dude, and that's example. where that's where his career exploded, right? It was like majority of these defensemen will not take time uh, the way you want them to. And again, it's not like Provorov has like not hit any kind of uh, progress. But again, I go back to how people treated Travis Sanheim. I go back a year ago, you guys would have thrown him away. And guess what? He's older than Provorov. Yeah, exactly. And people are screaming, get rid of Provorov now, keep Sanheim. So. Yeah, and what if Provorov has a, a breakout year next year? It's going to be the same thing, <laughs> unfortunately. it's it, I, I just don't understand. Like, Why do we always fall into these same traps? Like, I get the team. I get it. I get the team is bad. But this witch hunting stuff, it's never worked. It's never worked. It never does anything. All it does is make our city look like a joke. And not just Philly. Any team who does it starts yeah. to look like a joke. Yeah, you are the ones that end up looking silly, chasing athlete after athlete. You're Go making ahead. something up out of thin air, essentially. Like well, you're, you're chasing athletes out of town. Yeah, exactly. But for no reason, realistically, or for no, no legitimate reason and anyway. Again, we did it to Eric Lindros. So people could say whatever they want about town. We did it to our Connor McDavid. Like yeah. people don't understand. We did it to the guy that everybody in the league was like, oh my God, we wish we could have Eric Lindros. We're like, fuck you, you baby. Yeah, exactly. They did it to Mike Richards and Jeff Carter, and they won two Stanley Cups. So that's the that's the the, the closest. We did it to example. them after they went to the Stanley Cup. Yeah, exactly. They party too much. Yeah, they party too much. They party too much, and yet they still got to the finals. This team doesn't party enough, and they can't fucking win. So what exactly. does that tell you? Yeah, pretty much. And that's they so par- fucking fun. They party too much, and then they won two cups anyway. So yeah. it doesn't really matter. Uh, look, we're kind of jo- kind of joking, but at the same time, like it, kind of pointing out, like these witch hunts didn't exist. Yeah, they didn't exist when I was younger. This is new shit with social media, where Pretty you long. start tearing apart every single player that's available. Yeah, like before it was just aimed because he made money. Now it's like you literally. And the thing is, the thing is with the, with social media like that, it's just that, you know, once something gets out there, everybody just runs with it and it's like a wildfire and and it never stops. I will say this, like the Ellis rumor that he didn't want to be here. Right. Yeah. Same same thing. I'll tell you what, a Mac is definitely better than Yandel sealer and Connaughton. Yeah. There we go. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. All right. Let's keep going. What's next on our topic here. Um, I guess we kind of have this overall thoughts on the season. Yeah. Um, let's dig into that, and then we'll talk about the draft. Um, we do have like AHL, NHL, like who's going to take a step. But let's just combine all that together. So let's just talk about like overall thoughts, who we think is going to take a step forward, who we think could take a step back, yeah. um, maybe stuff we're looking forward to. I- I'll let you go first. Soon. Yeah, sounds good. So, I mean, obviously disappointing season. Yeah. Terrible season. <laughs> Nobody was seven two pens, by the way. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. I thought that was gonna. I thought Rangers were tied up. That's yeah, crazy. I, I just want to say this before we get uh, continue. The amount of blowouts this playoff so far. This play, I've never seen anything like this. What I do notice as well is there's tons of power plays. Like they're calling uh, a lot of the games like it's a regular season game, which I'm not gonna say I don't like, but it's also. I mean, there are the rules, so. I'd rather them call it like the same way all year than change it up for the playoffs. Fair enough. Personally. Um, but yeah, anyway, and just overall thoughts, terrible season. Nobody expected the Flyers to be this bad. I mean, if you look at most of the projections from the beginning of the season, most you know national media pundits had the Flyers making the playoffs. That did not happen. Uh, a big reason was injuries, mainly Couturier, Ryan Ellis uh, are the big ones there. Um, in terms of you know players that I think – maybe on their way out. Um, I mean, JVR is the main one that we've talked about for weeks on, on weeks on weeks. So that's who I would like to see go personally. Other guys that might uh, have a chance to be traded that I could potentially see get moved, you know, if the right deals there, if there's a good hockey trade 
Um, I, I could see a Lindblom, as we touched on before, Scott Lawton, depending on what's mm-hmm. happening there, maybe even a Konechny potentially as well. But that have to be more of, you know, if you're going to trade a Konechny, at least for me, it's got to have to be like a young center that, I, mm-hmm. that I'm going to want back. Um, other than that, uh, player standouts from this season, I mean, there weren't a lot of positives. The best player on the team, in my eyes, uh, Carter Hart, Travis Sanheim. Those are those are my standouts for the season. They they play very very well. Travis Sanheim, you know, looked um, like a player that was confident in his abilities for you know I'd say the first time in his career. Uh, he looks very confident in himself and what he can do offensively and on the rush. And hopefully that grows and continues. Carter Hart looked very good, rebounded from a terrible season, just shows the mental, um, you know, adversity that he can overcome. And the fact that he, he, you know, he's a, he's a strong guy in net for the team going forward. And that's what you need. You need to build up from the net moving forward. Another player who also, I, I thought had a good season was Konechny, even though a lot of guys, sh- you know, a lot of people and a lot of media shit on him for majority of the year. I thought he had a good season. Um, over 50 points on a very bad team. Um, and then also Cam Atkinson, uh, first season as a flyer, played very well, uh, t- uh, very well too there. How about you, Yuri? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Guys, I think, like, could be on the move. I mean, there's not really any difference. I think Patrick Brown is a guy who maybe might not oh, yeah, stick well. with the team very long. There's a lot of minor stuff. I think maybe Zach McEwen might not end up being here next year. Yeah. Um, there's still some names kind of kind of floating around. I don't think Provov or Sanon. No, I don't know. I think those are complete nonsense uh, rumors. I do think you know, depending on Ryan Ellis not being here, you know, one, you're definitely not getting rid of one of them no. uh, with the status of Ellis. But <clears throat> with that, potentially leaves bringing in another guy on a short term contract. Uh, I think Owen Tippett is gonna have a big year next oh, year. Oh, I, I forgot to mention him, but I agree with you there as well. Yeah, I think Very Owen. High on him. T- at the very least, they'll pencil him into a top six spot. I think. I think yeah. they're going to hope that you know he has the type of off season they're looking for. Frost too. I think he's supposed to stick around the uh, Philly area this off season, so that's always bodes well for the training and the that, team that really is, likes that. Yeah. Um, and then right. interesting thing, uh, I saw Bill Meltzer make a tweet this week, uh, stating that you know for the last half of the season, Frost and Tippett, or uh, or I think I think it was Tippett was one. Frost was two, Fairby was three, uh, were the highest three for expected goals on the ice uh, last half of the season for the Flyers. So that's encouraging. That's hilarious. Um, Yeah, yeah, and I I do. I think Frost will probably take a step forward. I think we saw enough from the end of this year that if he can if he can continue to play that way, he's definitely um, a valuable NHL player. I don't know what his ceiling is still at this point. We will see, but I you know I, I still believe in his youth. His ability to get better. I think Bobby Brink most likely will start in the AHL, um, but I don't think he'll be there very long. Uh, I think York will start off in the NHL. I don't think he's going to be playing in the minors next year. I think Zamula will still be in the minors. And I think some guys from like NCAA will probably be playing. I think Atar will probably start in the minors. Um, I think uh, think Cates will make the team. Cates will make the team. I think so as well. Um, I think. Again, you know, I do think Oscar Limbaugh is at, is at risk of getting traded. Um, yeah. it, it depends. If they can't get rid of JVR, um, you know, they got to consider it. They got to find money somewhere. So we'll they, they got to find money. And they also have a log jam of like certain type of players. And um, wingers, yeah. Yeah. I don't think they're looking to move Limbaugh. I think that'll be a last, last resort. Yeah, yeah. Last resort thing. Um, but I do think, I think moving JVR is 100% possible. So I think that's that's a big focus, and I also think it depends on how this draft goes. Like, depending on who we get, we, you know, if we get a defenseman in the draft, yeah. you know, if it's um, isn't Nemich, isn't he right-handed? Nemich, yes. Is Juracek right-handed too? Ah, uh, that I'm not sure. I have to check, but I know Nemich is for sure. Yeah. So I mean, just to, let's just say I don't know who the best one is in the draft. You know, I know that the two of them are pretty much one and two, depending on who you ask. Um, you know, you get a, a top young defenseman. Maybe they try to play them in the NHL next year. Maybe you do a, a York Nemich pairing on the bottom. You know, maybe Nemich is the guy who plays with Provorov, you know, just because they're, you know, fuck it. You know, they're just going with a young D and they'll see what happens next year and then bring somebody else. I don't know if that's going to be the case, but, you know, I think a lot of it matters. If you get a Logan Cooley, 
he can't play in the NHL next year. So do they no. find a, sh- a short term? Do they give Frost the opportunity and be like, OK, we'll see if Frost works out. You know, we have Joe O'Brien is still out there. Maybe he's coming next year, whatever. You know, maybe they take a more patient approach. Maybe they get, um, you know, Ke- uh, Kamel and he ends up coming over to the Flyers. He's not going to stay over. He won't stay in Europe if, no. if that type of player will come over. So Slavkovsky will also come over any of the defensemen. I think that stuff matters. If one of these, again, we're getting a top five pick here, potentially even could even be a number one pick for all we know. Yeah. If they win the, the if draft they get lottery Shane tomorrow. Right. Like, let's just say I, again, I, if I have first overall pick, I'm still taking Cooley over Shane, Wright. I'm not an expert on this, but everything I've seen tells me that Cooley is my guy. But if you get a guy like Shane, Wright. And you you draft first overall, your plans change a little bit. That all changes sudden, the dynamic. Yeah. All of a sudden, you uh, gotta get rid of JVR because where the fuck are you gonna put Shane Wright? You know, yeah. I guess you could try to leave Shane Wright in the minor, but what, or not in the minors in the juniors. But who leaves a guy who's dominating juniors first overall pick in juniors? Looks like you're bringing him into the NHL. You want to play in that third line center spot, and that changes a lot. And then all yeah. of a sudden, maybe your only focus for the off season is a defenseman. Yeah, exactly, and then that changes things for Morgan Frost too, and a whole ton of stuff. So there's then a Frost lot. Winger. Yeah, there's a lot that's gonna unfold with the draft, and I think that's a good segue to kind of getting into our our draft talk uh, here. So the Flyers are currently fourth. Um, lottery. Well, let's just say this as well: the lottery draft is tomorrow. We're filming. Yeah. It. Well, it'll actually be the day you're listening to this. Yeah. So by yeah. the time a lot of you are listening to this, we'll know what pick the Philadelphia Flyers have. Yeah, so right now it's fourth. Um, I think they were saying that it's very unlikely based on the odds for them to stay at four. So they're most likely going to move around, I think. Let's do, um, uh, let's do a screen share for the first time, which I've never done on okay. here. But we're going to do it right now because it's topical. This That's is not topical. That That's Zoom. This is topical. Can you see my screen? Yes, I do. I Sweet. like it. All right. I like that. Let's go with the mock there. Um, the Flyers get Logan Cooley at four. That is something I would definitely love. I mean, to be honest, I would be fine with the Flyers getting Shane Wright, Slavkovsky, Nemich, Cooley, or Savoy. I like all those players personally. So, like, I, I'd be fine with Kamel as well. Yeah, Kamel, Kamel too. Um, Juracek, I don't know if he's right-handed. Sim? I... Fuck. Oh, there, there's Kamal for you. But Juracek, I think I'd be fine with two. I just don't know if he's right-handed. I kind of want to check on that right now. I, I do. I want to preface that is important question. I do want to preface this that we for next episode, which will be I think the seventeenth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have steve cornianos our draft expert coming back on the show i'm so fucking pumped which by the way check out his podcast the draft analyst he's he started doing podcasts again i don't know if you saw Vasily. yeah i did yeah, actually yeah I've, I've listened to all of them so far he's all, he's he, killing it <laughs> you guys have to realize like i found this guy on my own just searching for podcasts and he was like my favorite hockey podcast and now the he's wealth like, of knowledge is he, crazy with he you. is our draft guy and yeah. Uh, he's off Twitter. Like uh, me and him have uh, exchanged phone numbers at this point. I talk to him all the time. He is a fucking man. Um, and I'm so excited to have him back on. Uh, um, it's going to be a great episode, especially yeah, too. Awesome. We're going to, we're going to know where the flyers pick. So and we're going to have, well. have a better insight kind of in that the, as well. Into yes. what Steve thinks on, on where <laughs> they should go with that pick. I, I did check your is a right-handed defenseman. So that's another he, option. That's a huge. And a lot of people think he's actually better than Nemich. And I've heard yeah. that. I, I've, heard I, I've I've seen some takes like that as well, which well, I mean, they're have both you watched like, their footage? I've only watched like highlights. Yeah, your tech seems to be more dynamic. He does. Yeah, I've watched. Uh, I think Nemich was at the Olympics, correct? Because I, I remember seeing him at think the Olympics. So. I think. Yeah. yeah. But other than that, I haven't seen them aside Check. from highlights. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, again, I'm I'm still sticking with Logan Cool. He's my number one guy. He seems like a hybrid of like Zegris meets like Joel Farabee. Which I like because they need that creativity in the center. And he's a really. two, yeah, but he's a he's a creative, dynamic two way center. Which is he, what you ideally would like in a center. Yeah, so. he's a. <laughs> and from what I can tell, he's more dynamic than Shane Wright. Probably not as good defensively. No, but more dynamic offensively, and that's why it's like that's the balance we need. 
I say Wright's more in the mold of a Couturier. I mean, he right, have exactly. Same, he doesn't have the same size as a Couturier. Like, he's but still that, 6'1". He's got good yeah, size. Yeah, yeah, But, but like, same same type as, like, a Couturier. Bergeron, Bergeron. Bergeron seems to be the appropriate. Th- that as well, yeah. So, I mean, can't go wrong there. If he know. turns out to be a Bergeron, he's going to be one of the best players in the National Hockey League. So, it, exactly. I'm not crying if we get Shane Wright. That's no. not, you know. Again, I I'm very the type of player that Cooley is. That's the type of player I usually yeah. You know, that's, I'm the type of player, that's the type of player I'm you know leaning towards more too. I mean, let's be real, a uh, fun, creative, offensively dynamic player. That's somebody you love to watch, right? So, well, let let me ask you this: Do you think that that the that this group of players, yeah, that there a lot of them are about. Right. Like, I still don't understand why you're, you're a, is that how you say, you're a Slavkovsky? Yeah. I still don't understand why he's ranked second. There, I have not seen anything about him so far outside of his size, right? And the fact that he's very young and playing well against men to make him jump over the other prospects. Um, Again, I'm no expert. I haven't seen enough, but I'm just saying. It doesn't and, seem like there's a big difference here between Slavkovsky and S- maybe Savoy or Kamel. Yeah. Really, it's just, in my opinion, it's that Olympic showing that he had really and that's like dangerous. his stock. Yeah, because he's not playing against the top, you know, and talent in that sense in that tournament just well, based on who went. So. It's it's not just that. It's like you're also you're doing what fans it's small, are doing. It's a small sample size. He like, played like I'll give you the stats. He played seven games of the Olympics and seven scored goals. seven goals. Yeah. Well that's also seven games. He could have been on a heater. So. He also scored five goals in, against men this year. Yeah. The same exactly. level of competition in like what? Like 31 30, games. 31 yeah, 30 games, games, 10 points plus one. It, don't get me wrong. It's not bad. I'm not saying he doesn't belong in the top no. group. I just don't understand. Like what really is the number two in this draft? I mean, perfectly personally, if for me, I'm, it's Logan Cooley. Yeah. So. Personally, if I'm ranking it. I would go, I mean, I'm going to give right. The contestants number one, just because he's been that for so long. So whatever, I'll give him that personally. If I get one, I'm picking Cooley. That's my opinion. We're on the same page there. Yeah. I just yeah. like his skill set better for the flyers and what they kind of need on their roster. Um, Cause they already have a Katuri and a Hayes who are kind of more in the mold of like what a right would be for them. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, for me, it's probably uh, right. Um, Cooley, then Nemich. And then I'm going Savoy, then Slavkovsky after that. Yeah. And, and again, I don't have a problem with your rankings whatsoever. Not yeah. against them at all. I don't, I don't know who's right or who's wrong. I do know yeah. one thing though, and this is outdated Right, this is a mid-term ranking. This is not a final ranking. That is so important. This would be before the Olympics, correct? Right, exactly. This is not a final ranking, so this is not accurate yet. I'm sure they're going to release their final rankings pretty soon. Yeah, <clears throat> but I look at lists like when Bob McKenzie and um, Craig Button usually do these. At the end, there is no more accurate guess and the reason bob mckenzie's in particular is more accurate than everybody else is doing it for years so. it, it's not just that he's literally just surveying scouts these yeah. are not his rankings at all where craig button is giving you his, his rankings. rankings yeah yeah mckenzie and button you always do different that's why i like mckenzie's rankings as well because like you said it's a They're survey great. of the scouts exactly so you kind of get an insight into what nhl team scouts are thinking going into the draft yes and the button cool. who's a former gm yeah. right and you can see how he's thinking exactly and, and the answer is usually right somewhere in the middle there but if you look at this list in comparison to the tankathon list like it's not that consistent no you, you but know i mean that as you can see, those those same like one two three four five guys are still there but it's all shifted around so realistically i mean if you're picking in the area the flyers are picking they're gonna get a chance at a high-end guy it's just who is that going to be? Uh, I mean, personally, Cooley would be just with his skill set, his you know dynamism offensively is what the Flyers really need because they need that offensive spark in their lineup that can create for them. This is uh, well. This is why I'm really excited to have Steve on is because I give us a better insight because he's I, watched these guys a lot more. Well, I want the nuance of like what really is like Joachim Kamel, right? I think yeah. he was. Uh, I think Fletcher just went to go see him play the other day. Like th- this is a guy who was ranked extremely high. 
And I'm pretty sure I and I could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure he's Steve Cornelius is number two. Yeah. In the draft. OK. And you want to. He's playing in the uh, Liga, so w- once again with Madden, he has 23 points in 39 games. It's pretty good. For well, that's game. that's my point. And then I look at yeah. Slavkovsky, and I'm like, okay, he's got five goals. Yeah. So why is he rated higher than a Kamel, which is totally understandable. Okay, so I look at another guy like Logan Kraus, who I think he was ranked number seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And I remember the Flyers were potentially slated to take him, and I – Again, this is not a bad player. And quite frankly, he had a good yeah. year this year. Lawson Cross was good this year. Yeah. But I remember looking at him like, well, this guy's skill set is not top team, 10. It's not what the team but, needed. Anyway. But it's also not top 10 skill set. No. Like it was ranked top 10 because it was very good for what he is. Yeah. His game. And you're wondering maybe that's the same thing with Slavkovsky potentially. Yes. Right? I could yeah. see it because I've been wrong though. I don't know. Yeah, him at all. neither do I. I, I haven't really seen don't. too. I haven't seen him too much, and I also think a lot. A lot that you have to take into account is. I mean, he's a big guy, six four. The size plays a factor with the it's skeleton. Seven, the I think he's seventeen. Yeah, that's what I mean. So he had even room to grow. Maybe six four, two hundred and what was it? Two hundred fifteen pounds. Yeah, like yeah. two hundred twenty pounds. Six yeah. four, and he was like that at seventeen years old. He just turned eighteen, right? Oh, you're still not yeah, in really, March. Yeah, that's crazy. Jesus. That's insane. We're on 2004 birthdays. Oh, man. I mean, that's Eric Lindros' size. Yeah, pretty much. So that's a, I mean, if he knows how to use that in the NHL level with the way the game is now, I mean, that could be attractive. Well, that's, that's, that's a part of it. The too. thought, yeah, that's yeah. probably where a lot of this is coming from. Yeah. Um, and you look at the you, under 20. You can't, yeah. Yeah. You can't hold in clutch, right? Like how you used to. So with a guy of his size, he, if, if he can make it translate, like that's attractive. But like you said, you got to put it all together. So who really knows? So, Cause it's just based on potential and the, and the size that he's up there. Or is it more based on the actual skill? That people yeah. See it's hard. It's hard to dissect. Once we get Steve on, I'm sure he'll give us a better window. I can't, into I, it. I can't wait for next episode. So who do you think, who are your top three, assuming we don't get first overall, and assuming Shane, because I think Shane Wright is going first overall. Yeah. Whatever, I don't think any GM is risky enough to not take him yeah. because the downside is too high and the upside is just as high as the other guys. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? And, the, then, and literally like the, the, worst, the worst case scenario for him is he's going to be a third line center, which I mean, isn't bad. So uh, yeah. And, and probably will uh, realistically his worst case scenario is a second line center, but yeah, yes, pretty much. but yeah, to your point, yes. Like his ceiling is like high. a Jordan Stahl type, or is uh, his look exactly like, you say, like which is exactly. his worst? Which he, is the he's, worst? He's either Jordan Stahl or he's, he's P- Bergeron. Patrice Bergeron, right? Yeah. So, so it's like th- th- it's not a big risk there for a team. You're no. Always going to get a good player. The question is like, is a guy Logan Cooley? Is that another Trevor Zegers? Yeah, you know, which has a, and that's know, the thing. It's more like is is your first overall pick going to be a franchise changing pick? Where if it's like on the stall end, it wouldn't be. But I, on the Bergeron end, it would. Be. I I think the, the fact there are no generational players here is doesn't bother me. No, I mean, there are plenty of players at the top of this draft that, that are, are superstar for, players. For what mind. the Flyers are looking for, this yeah. is a draft we can make ourselves better. Now yeah. you did ask me a question, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, and when we were asking for topics, you said, "Would you trade this year's first round pick?" And my answer is only. If I am trading it with a team who I know is going to be goddamn garbage next year and it improves my chances to get a Bedard or Michikov because we yeah. never, ever get the opportunity to get those type of players. That's very true. And if we get one of them, it is franchise changing. And if we're bad twice next yeah. year and we have two top, two, ten, two, two top 10, two five top five picks, that's enough to either package, yeah. probably not, to get in there, or at least up our odds. That was my uh, that was my thinking too. Like, and that's why I kind of asked it. Like, if, if a team says, you know, who's I don't know, let's uh, hi, let's be hypothetical. Let's say uh, who's bad. Like, let's say the Devils, because the Devils said they were looking to trade their or pick. Seattle. Let's just or say Seattle. Seattle. Yeah, Seattle. Seattle. They're the not going to do it, but yeah. But whatever. Let's say they're like, well, okay, we'll trade next year's pick. Hypothetically, I take it. Yeah, we, we we let's say we get the number three pick in the draft, and they're yeah. like, we fucking love Eurocheck. We want Eurocheck. 
We yeah. need a D-man. That's exactly what our team is looking for. We'll give you this. We'll give you our first next year. Not No protections. And we'll give you, I something don't know, else. give you your second for this year. Yeah. You know? And we'll give you something else, too. I'd, I'd have, you have to, to strongly that. consider. You have to strongly consider it just because then the opportunity to get a Bedard or Mitchkoff significantly increases really. Yes. And, and, may- and you could maybe use your two picks to trade up to get one of those guys potentially too. If you have the first overall pick, do you trade down? Do I trade down? Ooh, it depends what I can get. I mean, that's the first thing. Um, if let, I had, let, let's say the yeah. downgrade is uh, Savoy. Downgrade um, Savoy. Um, from, this is, uh, yeah, or so, even any any of the guys, Kamel Savoy. Because the cool. flyer, the flyers don't have a second round pick, correct? This in this upcoming correct. draft, do they not? Neither. So Neither this year, the next. I mean, if you trade down, like let's say you're the first overall pick and you trade down a couple spots and you pick up a second, I I would do it personally. I don't think I would. Yeah, that's fair enough. I, I just think- don't think. I don't think there's an, enough of a gap between Wright and Cooley and Savoy for me to like I, not take. I think I think I would just take Logan Cooley. Yeah, that works too. I think I think I, I would make the the pick that nobody expected and do it anyway and be like, that's the guy I want. I'm going for I it. I like it. It's a corner store piece. He's a top line center potential. Sure, yeah. it's not Connor Bedard, but maybe he's a 90 point player in the NHL. Yeah, that's exactly. enough to turn my team around. Exactly. That that I I can understand that. I mean, it'd be a hard one. Like I'd be very on the fence about it personally. Yeah, it'd be really um, difficult. So I mean, Fletcher, if, if any of those situations come up, I don't uh, wish to be in his shoes. That'll be tough for him to. D- I to, dude, I to, hope to we don't get first that. over. It sounds horrible, but I don't want the first overall pick. <laughs> Because then you're kind of forced into taking it right. Well, not forced into it, but if you don't take him, then it's going to be a huge. And if deal, you so. do take him, and a guy like Cooley explodes right afterwards, that's also and another you have to deal with this again. And yeah. a guy like Nemich, and then all of a sudden he's just as good as the other guys. Maybe he's not even a flop. Yeah. You know, people are really hard on Nico Heischer. I've heard that. I've heard a lot of people say that, like, you know, it's like you know Makar and Heiskanen and uh, and Pedersen. And you know he sure's you know he's been all right. I'm pretty sure uh, he sure has better numbers than majority of those guys that I just named. Like yeah, I'm pretty he's... sure Nico he sure is legitimately a very good prospect in the. I NHL. mean, he has 60 points in 70 games this year on a shit team. So. Exactly, and, and yeah. I don't see people talk about it. like I I personally I wanted Nolan Patrick because I knew we were gonna Nolan Patrick, and I I thought okay, look, big strong center, he's got all the skills. You know, it might take a little bit uh time to develop it, but this is a guy that I'm like, this is another Couturier type, right? This is another yeah. two-way center, big, strong, can score. But in my mind, I was like, well, he shares more of my type of player. And yeah. this is, again, why I go more towards somebody like Logan Cooley because I'm like, this is my type of guy. He's a yeah. speedy center who's two-way savvy, can play make, but also a goal scare. Or I was like, this is the same reason I fell in love with like, Claude Giroux. Like, yeah. this is what we need. We need Speaking that. of Claude Giroux, uh, the Panthers and Caps are in They overtime. scored with, what, two minutes left yeah, in the period, and now uh, yeah, they're in overtime. Reinhardt, yeah. yeah, Man, that's a big game for the Panthers. If they don't win this, they're looking They're, like they're fucked. Trouble. I hope Giroux scores the overtime winner. That'd be sick. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Me too. Well, that's – that. yeah, the draft's going to be interesting. Um, personally – I think the Flyers keep their pick. I don't think they trade it. I think the only way they're trading the pick is if they're getting like an established first line NHL player or for forward or defenseman. I don't even um, I don't even think that would do it, dude. I really don't. Because think about think about the cap problem that we're in. Well, yeah, yeah. The cap and then all of a sudden you're up. you're giving up on a high have to, player have to be, on an ELC. It have to be a young. It have to be a young guy. Um, but and for some reason they it, it, the team they, there have to be some sort of weird situation where. You know, a team would be wanting to get rid of a young guy of that caliber who's a first time player anyway. So it's going to be it's very rare. Now. Yeah, it's, it's very it's rare. It's not out there. It's rare for that something like that to happen. It's, our pick's too high. I can see a top 10 pick, but. Yeah. Hypo- okay. I'm going to give you five. I'm going to give you an interesting scenario. Let's say Calgary decides they want to sign Johnny Goudreau, and then they say, well, we'll take your pick off your hands and we'll give you Matthew to Chuck. What do you do then? That's a tough one. That's that's the right situation. The problem it is, is, yeah, the cap, the cap, the cap. But, but I mean, uh, fuck, get rid of JVR. 
I, I think to your point, I think absolutely consider it, but I think I'd have to make it a bigger deal. Yeah, that makes sense. I'd be like, you guys, you guys have to take something. I, I, I just uh, wanted to bring that up as like an example of yeah. what I would, I would be, that's the only thing I would accept, like a player of that caliber in a deal like that. Sure. But that, that's a that. top five pick young, yeah. young player. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, to your point, but why would they pick Goudreau over the chuck? Like they're not going oh, to. Right? Oh, fuck. I don't it, know. No, no, no. Really no to your point, for the same reason that we're not trading the draft pick for a yeah. uh, more veteran player yeah. because we're up against the cap and we need the ELC years. Like if we have a guy, like let's say we do take Cooley. He doesn't play this year anyway in the NHL. He plays in college, comes to us the following year. All of a sudden, we got rid of JVR. Our team potentially is a little bit better. Our cap is cleaned up a little bit. We took a year off. And then you got a young guy on ELC. And you got a, exactly. You got a young guy in ELC. Your team's all, all of a sudden better. And then you add a 60 point player onto your team on making a million for dollars nine, a year. Yeah, for nothing. Is that more valuable than Matthew Tuchuk, who puts up like 80 to 90 points, who's making 8 million a year? It could be exactly. It could be exactly. Yeah. It's like, well, it, don't be wrong. It's a great question you brought up because uh, yeah. God knows Matthew and Chuck is in everybody's hearts here. Like, uh, I, I just wanted for conversation. I thought it would be, it. yeah, I thought it would be interesting. Um, but just shows that like there could be a lot of options that you know are going on behind closed doors that I could see. I could, I could see Eiserman moving Dylan Larkin for that would be interesting too. To pick. me, that would be interesting too to me. Like honest. that's something I could see Irish and be like, yeah, we'll take a couple more years off. I'll take uh, I'll take Shane Wright and you, you yeah, Dylan you Larkin. Have Dylan Larkin because you guys, you guys can go compete. Get yeah, he, he's like, I'll, I'll be more patient and get because like you, he said everything's on the table. That tells him like his core is cider and mm-hmm. Raymond. He's like trying to align with those guys. Yeah, <laughs> I Berks really don't see it happening. Larkin though. type. No, yeah, I don't. I don't think the Flyers trade the pick. To be honest, I think they made they make the pick here. Yeah, because I think because I think they, they hope they move up. Yeah, they hope they move up and and they hope they make the pick. And I I'm leaning towards the fact that they'll probably make the pick just for the just for the reasoning that I mean the team's looking to compete as soon as they can apparently. So yeah. if that's the case, when is the other? When's the next time they're going to be in a top five pick situation? Right. So you got to cash in on it. On, honestly, if they bring in Barry Trotz and they sign a couple players. And they fix some of the problems that are going on. And they draft uh, a young, really good player. They're probably not coming back into that top five again for for a while. while. I agree. They're going to be in that 10 to 15 range at the very lowest. And that that's why I kept saying this for months. I was like, you got to take take advantage advantage of the season. Like, cause this team with Couturier is just not as bad. I know we all want to pretend like they are. They're 500 with him. We, we brought this up with him. They were 13, 13 and one. I wouldn't be surprised if if their points per game or their goals against per game would go down a full goal with Couturier with him yeah. and with him and Ryan Alice, Alice yeah, come yeah. out potentially one point five. So am I getting us out of the bottom in every category immediately? And the PK automatically is no longer trash. Exactly. And it, again, this does not this is not me saying this is a contender. I'm talking about this is not approaching that top or that bottom five yeah. percentage anymore, and you're not in there anymore yeah and you're not in the position so, to really add that high-end talent through the draft like you kind of exactly. want exactly so, so gotta, this is this is potentially our only year this is their especially chance especially if ellis comes back yeah this is their chance Hopefully like i could back. i could see a case where they're like ellis needs to retire so we're gonna lti i him for the rest of his career yeah you know and he's gonna fail his physical every year and the flyers are like, okay our defense took a hit we're not gonna be bad for that long like i said earlier we're gonna take the year off though you know, and then next year try again, to sign a sign a defense. Go for Bedard. Yeah, you know, exactly. And then like that's the other option here. Like I know everybody thinks the Flyers are gonna be like, I don't know why everybody takes like the what stuff. people say in a press conference super seriously because like it, you got to read between the lines. You know, it, yeah, <laughs> it's not just that. It's like, it, why do you guys think that these people are dumb enough that their minds don't change? Yeah, but also they're never gonna like. In any sport, any you know, professional sport, no general manager is going to actually tip his hand off to be like, "Yes, I'm going to do this, 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 and that," and actually do it. Like it's just not how you it know, works. It's funny we talk about the Rangers writing that letter. Yeah, like they wrote that letter and then they didn't even do a fucking. They full did the either. opposite. They signed our Trevor. Didn't even do it. Yeah, traded for Jacob fuck- Truba. Like they fired their coach, brought on a new GM. He didn't fucking rebuild. 
The aggressive no. retool. They got two. They got two first, you know, overall first picks overall picks that made it look like a rebuild, but that they won the lottery both those and, times. So like, and fuck. neither neither one of those guys are the reason that they are in the position that they're in. No, though I, though Lafreniere, I think is going to break out soon. Like he's getting a lot better. I think he's going to be their probably their best player in like a, a two couple years. Years, yeah. but but the whole point is their team didn't turn around just because they got a first round pick. No, they did. They think Capo Caco is a guy they might end up moving. Oh. Panthers scored for Hagee in overtime. They got it? Yeah, 2-2. Two, two. Fuck, I, it looks like there's so many series that are 2-2 two, two that look like they might go to game seven. Crazy. Fuck yeah. Good I for love them. all that. I love I love that. I love to see Giroux get the, the series. Yeah, I don't want to see G get knocked out of the first round. Fuck yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Not, on, wanna... not on that team. No, exactly. Not against the Caps, against the Ovi. Fuck you, you know, Ovi. You know what, though? I will I will give the Caps credit because everybody was counting them out of this series. So I'll give yeah, them. but I agree, but I don't think they were paying attention. The Caps have been playing really strong lately. They, oh, yeah, no, for sure. I think it's just the, that Florida is such a strong team, though, too. That people are just automatically going to be like, yes, they're taking it. But some yeah. of these predictions that I saw, like all these national people saying, oh, Florida's going to sweep, like, you're fucking nuts like oh, i was like I, gonna sweep the preds well that yeah well i i, I mean i didn't predict the preds that. aren't as good as the cats yeah exactly exactly dude i i think people really don't understand how strong our division is in the metro very strong. like we're by far the toughest division in hockey i know people Hardest don't division, yeah. believe that but we definitely are like the penguins can beat any team in the fucking uh league yeah pretty much. A- outside outside of colorado which i say Colorado and Florida, like I get that. Like during the regular season, they sat in their own. But like you take those guys, those and teams, and you move are, them into our division. Man, the Pens are doing with fucking Louis Domingue in that right now, which is kind of cu- crazy to me. He's they could win the Stanley Cup this year with Louis Domingue. Yeah, it's kind of nuts, man. I can't believe that because our division's that fucking tough, and teams that like. Is- even, like, Carolina, even Carolina, like I could beat any team. I say, like, and now Boston, Boston's Boston, Boston can beat any team. Too. That's what I'm saying. The, the this is actually so. What's so crazy about a lot of these blowouts? It's not like one team is blowing out the no. other team. It's other both coming, teams are blowing, blowing each it. other out. Yeah, one team's coming with a blowout. The other team's coming with a blowout. It's it's pretty it, nice. Very strange. Very very strange playoffs, but. Do you want to end off on like some playoff predictions? Like, what are, what are your thoughts? Yeah, let's end on that. Uh, well. Do you want to, maybe we'll just do predictions of these current series? Just do who we think is gonna yeah, come yeah, out sure. of sure, what I'm, series. So let's start. Yeah, we can do it kind of like series by series as it goes on. I let's, guess. Well, let's start at the on the west. So Avs, uh, <clears throat> Avs, uh, what's it called? Predators. Game four is right now. Avs are up one nothing. Series. I think, three nothing. I think it's finishing tonight. It, I think it's a sweep. Agreed. Uh, the next one, Flames versus the Stars. Game four is also right now. The Flames uh, are down in the series 2-1. Uh, all of these have been tight games. I don't think they've had a single blowout in these guys. Yeah. Uh, what I'm do you thinking, think? Uh, I'm thinking Dallas in seven. Wow. I think Calgary comes back. Um, yeah. Takes it in seven. I, I could see it. I The only reason I go with Dallas is um, I just think a lot of their players have – I've uh, done it a lot longer and more in the playoffs, like with a uh, Jamie Ben and uh, Pavelski. So yeah. I'm just gonna give I'll give them the benefit of the doubt yeah. over, over some of the Calgary's players. They have never they've never got out of the first round with that group. So I don't think it's gonna happen now. So fucking hilarious. <laughs> Pretty funny. Honestly, I personally love watching these teams suffer because that's how we feel. Yeah, pretty much. At least we, we, hey, we got out of the first round. I mean, we might be bad now, but we won a couple of years ago. At least. Better record than Leaves. Yeah. Uh, so the next one is uh, the Wild versus the Blues. Series is tied 2 2. This one, man, I don't even know. This one's a tough one. I think St. Louis. I think St. Louis in seven. I think all these are going seven, man. Like all these close ones that are too right a now. A lot of them are. You know, that's yeah. a really tough one, the Minnesota St. Louis thing. I'm going to give the edge to Minnesota. Yeah, I was thinking Minnesota too. The only reason why, like, one. I'm going St. Louis just because, like, they won the cup and stuff. So I'm going to give them their experience. I'm going to give it to their experience. I think on I, paper, they're a little bit better. On paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Minnesota, exactly. On paper, with Flurry in that too, like, they got an edge there, I guess. So I see your pick. I understand it. Uh, I don't know. It, it, that's it, a toss up. Yeah, it's a toss up. It's a great matchup, honestly. 
probably going to seven. Uh, and then the Oilers Kings series also side uh, tied two two. Uh, again, blowouts going both ways on yeah. that guy. Um, mean, I'm I'm saying Oilers in. I'll I we won't do six. We'll do we'll we won't do seven this time. We'll do Oilers in six. Sure, uh, Kings in seven. I think the defense will take over as the series moves on. I think okay, to know and Kopitar will. I could see it for sure. My, shut the door. I just I want to see McDavid yeah, at least yeah. get out of the first round one. And he's I, like I will I will say this, this is probably the best Oilers team we've seen in a while. Yeah, it's really like how the fuck didn't they get a goalie, man? Like it's really that's what's holding them back. Like why they like why they should have traded for Martin Jones? They fucked up. But they traded for Duncan Keith. Yeah. I mean, I they know, they should have right. they should have traded for Gor- uh, Gorgiev. Yeah, that too. It's crazy to me how they can be like running with forty one year old Mike Smith. I just, I don't know. Uh, I just GM, can't. I just a can't. GM won't last too much long. What's his name? Um, Holland. Holland. Kevin Holland. Yeah. He's <clears throat> biggest mistake the Philadelphia Flyers ever made was going into that Stanley Cup Finals uh, with that Stanley Cup Finals caliber team with Brian Boucher. And, and Michael Layton. You need goaltending to win. Yeah. At least decent. Anyway. It, it, and we didn't even have six defensemen. We had four defensemen that could and play. Then, and then Perrin. And That's how Price good Jack. that fucking team was. I, I don't understand man. how dominant that offense Basically was. Basically, had two number one defenses with team in it and Frog. Yes. And it was unbelievable. Unbelievable team. All right. I love we can team. go to the East now. So. Okay. So we just have, we have Florida, Washington. They're officially tied 2 2. Uh, I'm going to take Florida in six. Florida in six. I'm with you on that one. I think uh, this is going to be a momentum changer. I think they'll probably win the next game. I agree. At home and then uh, probably close it out afterwards. Yeah. Uh, Rangers versus the Pens. Pit, uh, Pens lead uh, 3-1 in the series. It just won 7-2. As much as I hate to say this, because I don't want the Penguins to move on. It's going to be the Pens. Uh, it's going to be the Penguins, and it's going to be in five. It looks like, uh, dude, I would not be shocked if it's in five. I could see it going to six, but. Yeah. They got it other way, I think. Fuck you, Rangers. Fuck you, too, yeah. and your goalie and all the shit that everybody talks on the flyers of the Rangers and the Penguins. Fuck both teams. I agree. I hope you and both then, lose each other. Go to seven games and you both lose. And then we have the Leafs and uh, Tampa are tied 2-2. I think that's yeah. the most interesting series it's right now, the first <laughs> round, personally, for me. Uh, I can't see the Leafs winning, man. <laughs> and it sucks because like, I'm from Toronto, and I have so many buddies who love the Leafs and just like are diehard Leaf fans, and I just keep telling them, until I see Tampa show me otherwise, I cannot go against Tampa Bay. And just like Vasilevsky, I know he's going to lock it down and go into con smite Vasilevsky mode like he did last season when it gets on the line. And I think they're going to win in six. So I think Tampa's going to win tomorrow, and they're going to win back in Tampa, in my opinion. I'm going to take Toronto in seven. Jesus. And I'm, the you're reason going, I'm t- They're going with Leafs Nation. Oh, the, man. the reason I'm going Toronto in seven is because the Maple Leafs have won two years in a row, and a lot of times after you've done that, it just, it's not that it falls off the rails, you know, but like luck can't be on your side yeah, all the time. Yeah, Tampa two in a row, it's hard to, to go through. And, and Toronto can't not make it out of the first round for fucking ever. And this is the best team I've seen them have in a really long time. They're legitimately the best really good. This is the best team they've had since, you know, the Flyers played them in that series where yeah. Jeremy Roenick scored. The yes, one. yes. And this, I would argue, this team is better. And Austin Matthews they is the are. best player I've ever seen in a Leafs jersey. So yeah, they are. And I mean, that was like what in two thousand four. Yeah, that was the second mm-hmm. round, two thousand four, where the Leafs lost the Flyers. So it's been a long time. Uh, so we'll see what happens. I personally think it'll be Tampa. Did we get all the series in the? No, East? we we skipped one, and the last one was the the Bruins Canes oh, series. Yeah. Also tied two two. Canes are up two nothing in the series. Now the Bruins have come back and won That's two in a row. That's interesting to me. Like I'm gonna say, Carolina takes it uh, in seven. I think it's gonna go to seven this one as well. Uh, I, I think Carolina takes it, but I mean, it depends about their goaltending situation. Because if it, if like they're, I think Rant is playing hurt. So if Kochetov, the third stringer, has to go back in, then I don't really know. That'll be tough. Yeah. What a crazy series. And this is kind of my point. First game, Hurricanes up win 5-1. Second game, Hurricanes win 5-2. Third game, Bruins win 4-2. Uh, fourth game, Bruins win 5-2. Yeah, crazy. Crazy series. I mean, on paper... The best players for the Bruins have been getting better. 
Yeah, yeah, Marshan. Well, ever since they reunited the perfection line, they've been killing it. Yeah, and Marshan had five points the other night. Yeah, and called so D'Angelo. I think that's a problem. And that's called problem. Tony D'Angelo a racist to his face, so that was fun. Who did? Oh, so Marshan and D'Angelo were getting into it, and then Marshan Mar- called him Mar- a racist. Such a smart shit talker, dude. I know it was hilarious. He I was hits watching. You, he hits you where you know you're. Sensitive. I was watching it in the airport, and you call like like so basically D'Angelo is like signaling I- that he has a big nose. Yeah, he's kind of trying to make fun of him, and then he's like, "Yeah, well, you're a racist." You see him mouthing that to him, and then the ref just looks at him like, "Uh, did you just say that?" <laughs> Too bad he wasn't mic'd up for that. He probably wouldn't have said it if he was mic'd up, though. Let's be real. Marshan is an amazing troll. Yeah. All right, let's end it on that. Uh, this was actually a very long episode. It was fun too. Um, yeah, I had a fucking long ass day. Uh, all right, yeah, it was great. Um, yeah, we'll be back next week. Next week, we'll be with Steve Cornianos again. Super excited about that. Sorry for taking a week off and not saying anything. I just didn't feel like it, honestly. I have no good excuse. Yeah. I fucking hate Twitter, like, I, I can't explain anymore. I was on vacation too, so I wasn't really on Twitter too nah. much. And honestly, I should at least tell people we weren't having the episode last week, but I mean, if they listen, you I know what? Checked if, out. if they listened to our last episode, I think we mentioned it at the end, so there you go. No, I don't, maybe oh, we did. didn't. I think we might have at the we end. We mentioned that you were on a vacation, but oh yeah, that's true. I don't think we said we weren't going to have the episode, but either way, I mean, whatever. This is episode one hundred and six. Get over yeah. it. There's enough. People have had enough of the flyers after the season, so we could take a week off. I Feel needed, it. dude. I needed a break. <laughs> I agree. All right, Vasily, what do you have for people? What are you working on? Um, I'm going to have an article actually out tomorrow, and uh, so actually. Well, people will be listening to this on Tuesday, so the article will be out on Tuesday as well. Sweet. Awesome. So it'll be going into, uh, you know, some player development stuff that the Flyers need to kind of work on, I, I would say. Awesome. Well, make sure to follow us both on Twitter, and I just shit on Twitter. Though I will say this. Thank you, Elon Musk, for saving <laughs> Twitter. And yeah. I do believe he will save Twitter. He did I it with agree. every other company that he bought. He is a damn good. I I work in product and I work in tech. Twitter needed this bad, bad as as a product. This is what I do. Bad. It doesn't even have a fucking edit button. You know how much of a joke it is that you can't edit a tweet. When and I know every single other platform, you're it, able it was to edit. Yeah. it was done intentionally, and it creates so many fucking problems. I I've had enough of Twitter. Quite frankly, I've had enough. I, we all have. Is a toxic tool. Fix it. I agree. It's literally designed for people to hate each other. Bring the edit Stop button. It. Bring the edit button in, and you know, let people have better discourses. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's just hope it gets fixed. But please follow us. Um, I'm Y Wallach. He is fire it up. Um, and thank you, thank you everybody for listening. Again, I say thank you every time. Please like, subscribe, share, comment, do the whole thing. Working on something pretty cool. Um, uh, Vasily knows about it. I don't want to announce it because it's not. It's not official. I don't know if it'll be official. I've been let down before. But you I will guys say will this. be excited. Yeah, yeah, if it happens, it is huge for this show. Um, and it would be so fucking cool. Um, so hopefully it does happen. Um, probably yeah. won't tell you till afterwards. Yeah. So it don't look stupid if it doesn't happen. But <laughs> hopefully it does happen because that'd be really fucking and cool. And I think it'd be some, the start uh, of more. Even with that, yeah, start of more and even like a lot of cool draft stuff hopefully we're hoping to get out to the draft um, yes as well so um Montreal. and we'll be now that like i'm back and facility and again we have the off season we're going to be calling out to more guests and stuff like that we did a lot of episodes together but guests are coming back now um and we're going to be doing a lot more it's honestly so so nice to have you facility that if i have a problem now i don't have to scramble to find somebody like last minute we can just yeah, fucking do course. an episode of course and, i've loved it i've loved doing the pod so far it's only gonna get better yeah. It, dude, it's like there. It's it's literally therapy for me at this point. Pretty much. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Again, thank you everybody for listening. We love you. Please, please share it out. It's a humongous help. And again, I still can't believe this has been going as long as it has. So it's fucking awesome and uh, good things ahead. All right. Thank you everybody. Remember, love yourselves, and remember, stay gritty. <laughs>